Please welcome Semaphore co-founder and editor-in-chief, Ben Smith. Wow, it is incredible to see so many people in here. Um, I'm, I'm Ben Smith, the, uh, the co-founder, editor-in-chief of Semaphore. And um, welcome back to the Semaphore World Economy Summit here in, here in Gallup Hall. Um, and also to everybody who's watching online. Uh, Semaphore, as I hope you know, ma many of you know, but we're, we're brand new, is an ambitious new global news organization. Uh, we launched 18 months ago. I think we're one of the fastest growing new platforms in the news business. Um, and this is our biggest, most ambitious attempt at live journalism so far, and we're just incredibly excited about how it's, how it's turning out. And I hope you'll see it kind of follows the model of, of the journalism you'll see from us on, on all platforms, which is aimed at a highest common denominator audience of folks who really you know, understand and are interested in the big questions, um, looking for intelligent, independent, transparent journalism, and also for you know, shared facts, but, also, but, but room for disagreement around these shared facts in a, you know, in a civil, intelligent way, and diver recognizing that there are diverse perspectives. And I hope you're, you're sort of seeing that across our stages this week. Um, I should add, that this kind of independent journalism can't exist without, without great companies, great partners who, are, who support it. And I wanted to extend our thanks to the Hyundai Motor, Motor Group for being a founding partner of the World Economy Summit. Um, and finally, it's really nice to see so many competing journalists here, and we're eager to make some news. Thank you. Please welcome Hyundai Motor Company Global COO Jose Munoz and Semaphore co-founder and CEO Justin B. Smith. Good afternoon. Thank you, Ben, for that very kind introduction, and welcome all of you to the first afternoon of the, the World Economy Summit. Looks like a phenomenal audience out there, and what a uh, better way to start the afternoon on this subject of the future of mobility, um, something that touches us all in, in small, medium, and large ways. But what's most exciting is that we have with us today in Jose Munoz, um, really one of the, the great, great leaders of the global mobility industry and business. Um, Jose is the president and global CEO of Hyundai Motor Company. You may, if you read the newspapers and if you read Semaphore, you will know that Hyundai Motor Company is on a bit of a tear as a company, meaning that's an American expression, meaning doing extremely, extremely well. Uh, through uh, a lot of product innovation, a lot of uh, uh, sustainability-focused strategies, and all across the world. And actually, uh, one of the, the key um, architects of this strategy is with us today. So welcome, Jose. We're delighted to have you. Thank you, Justin. Thank you for having me in such a nice uh, event. This is really the, the Davos uh, of Washington, D.C. Eh? Oh, thank you. <laughs> I did not ask him to say that, actually. <laughs> no, he did not. <laughs> I just said it myself. Uh, well, listen, um, I know that you know, Hyundai um, Motor Group is, is not, you know, it's a company from South Korea originally, um, it, hu hugely famous uh, in Asia and in, in that part of the world. But here in the US, it's, it's, I think the scale and the, the ambition uh, is not that well understood. So maybe you could perhaps spend a few minutes giving us an overview of what you're up to at the Hyundai Motor Company. Well, that's, a, that's a really, really a pleasure. So the um, Hyundai Motor Group is really um, a very kind of a com comprehensive um, a conglomerate, right? So uh, people know us uh, because of our uh, automotive business. In reality, we have several brands. We have the Hyundai brand, Kia and Genesis, but we are so-called vertically integrated. So not so many people know that we are producing steel, as an example. Uh, we are also the uh, global leader in uh, logistics with Globis. So we do logistics of our vehicles and our competitors uh, as well. We uh, own uh, a company, robotic companies called Boston Dynamics, 80%, uh, uh, which, as you know, has also the Boston Dynamics AI, artificial intelligence. A lot of people talking about it now, right? Yeah. So we've been working on that for years. Uh, we, for example, um, uh, have a 50% uh, joint venture 
um, in Motional, which is an autonomous driving uh, technology company. We do our own advertising uh, within uh, InOcean. We have created an EV toll company, uh, Supernal, Electric Vertical Takeoff and Landing. And then uh, as we speak, uh, because uh, we uh, are, I would say, South Korea is the biggest ally to the United States, we believe uh, this is the, the most important market for us, uh, representing uh, about 25% of uh, our global business, much more in profits, but also the fastest growing. And we are all in, uh, in the future in the US with big investments, uh, namely in Savannah, with assembly plan, with battery plant a joint venture, uh, with yet a second uh, battery plant joint venture. I'll, I'm but sure but through the conversation we'll give you that, much more data. Uh, so b backing up a little bit, so you talked about this sort of sprawling, vertically integrated company, but to all the, the, con the consumers of automotive products in the room, which is everyone, tell, what is the automotive business? I mean, how big are you rel relative to your competitors? Are you... Are you uh, ac across the board and, and maybe in some of the newer electric vehicles? So, <clears throat> uh, Hyundai Motor Group is now the third global OEM uh, after Toyota and Volkswagen. And we are uh, also the third one in America in retail sales. So this is, uh, this is quite third. a lot. Yeah, we are the third. Uh, and we are the second one uh, in terms of uh, uh, EV sales after Tesla and closing the gap step by step. So second, some... second after Tesla. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. How would it like to compete with Tesla? It, it is tough. <laughs> it, it is tough, but we do our best. Uh, you know, we got um, a great product. So we are the only brand who decided to create a sub brand, so called Ionic, for uh, electric exclusive platform vehicles. And then Ionic 5, two years ago, was uh, elected uh, the World Car of the Year, the EV Car of the Year, the uh, Design Car of the Year. Uh, last year, Ionic 6, same thing. And this year, the first time ever, just three weeks ago, I was in New York uh, getting the uh, World Performance Car of the Year with the Ionic 5N, 600 horsepower. So, okay, I mean, Tesla is, you know, obviously one of the, the greatest stories of innovation and growth. Obviously, it's, it's tied with some broader issues as well. But what, what was it like coming into this market and, and, taking, and taking on this, this iconic American company? And how did you get to number two? Was it, I mean, what, were the, what was the formula? Was it, uh, it must have been innovation-based because Tesla is the icon of innovation. Well, the, the summit of innovation is our executive chair, Mr. Chung. He is our chairman, uh, and then he is very innovative, very forward-looking, and then bring in uh, new ideas, new technologies. So the first thing we did, we were the first ones to bring a exclusive uh, battery electric platform, a so-called EGMP, right? So it's very difficult to compete with uh, guys who have exclusive battery EV platform like Tesla. So most of our competitors do a car which has two different technologies in the same car. So you cannot optimize, you cannot get all the benefits of the EVs, right? And so a decision like that, for to, the, does that take many, many years to implement? I mean, that, when, when was that decision taken? This is, a, our company applies a Korean com, a concept that we call the Pali Pali. Pali so Pali. Uh, extremely fast, extremely fast. So gather the elements very quickly and then the chairman decides immediately uh, on what is the right thing, and the execution is the fastest in the industry. This is a South Korean uh, power, and our company is the best example of that. Very it's, fast. It's, it sounds just like Elon Musk sleeping in the factory. Uh, well, <laughs> I think we, we talk less, we do more. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, the, um, so, so the American market, obviously, is a, is a priority market for you. Um, with all this success on products and innovation and this, this rapid Korean-style execution, what, what is happening on the ground in America right now? Where is Hyundai investing? Uh, the EV market obviously has been a huge growth area. It's seeing a little bit of some, some sputters. Uh, people are saying the hybrid, the hybrid market might be uh, showing more growth. So g give us the, the Hyundai Motor Group's um, or company's U.S. strategy right now. Absolutely. So we've seen, uh, whilst uh, most people are thinking uh, that uh, electric uh, 
world is not going to get to the expected uh, level, <clears throat> what we see is that definitely there is growth. And just to give you some uh, data points, outside of the US, uh, more or less, the, the global uh, battery EV market is about 20%. Here we are today at 8%. And a lot of people are saying uh, that they don't see the future. <clears throat> In our case, last year we doubled the sales of uh, EVs. Uh, with the Ionic 5, Ionic 6, uh, etc., on all electrified vehicles, including uh, hybrid and plug-in hybrid and hydrogen, we grew about 50%, uh, and then in total, an 11%. So it, it means the, um, the battery electric vehicles are the ones driving uh, our growth. So when it comes to uh, uh, how we see the, the market, so we still see EV is going to be the technology of the future, but beyond that, we are advocating for the hydrogen, right? So, and then we want to ensure that when we do something which is good for the, for the environment, it is complete, and we want the full ecosystem to be completed. So I just mentioned at the beginning that we are investing big time in Savannah, Georgia, with- Is, uh, that, is that a new investment? It is a brand new investment, which is going to be online uh, in October this year. It's a $12.6 billion investment. All right, so when was that decision taken and when did you? Uh, that, <laughs> was, uh, that was uh, two years ago. And two. then uh, meanwhile, a lot of companies are still uh, struggling uh, with, the, with the EV battery development. Our company said, okay, we go. Then IRA hit, uh, it was not good for us because we didn't qualify, and then we doubled down, and then we are still on time. So in a record time of 18 months, uh, since we started uh, construction till uh, we will start producing cars, we're going to be in production. Imagine this, so it's 12,000 direct jobs. We're going to bring to the region 40,000 jobs. <coughs> we have invested also in a battery as, uh, assembly plant uh, together with LG Energy Solutions, and then yet another battery plant with SK on in Bartow, Georgia. So um, according to uh, the Center for Automotive Research, in 21, before we even started this investment, we were having an impact already in the country of about $20 billion, 190,000 uh, employees, right? So it's huge, huge undertaking, and then we can wait to get all this and to start selling vehicles uh, to the market. So when does the first uh, EV, is it an EV factory exclusively? <coughs> it is in principle an EV factor, factory exclusively, but we, uh, we're gonna be flexible if we need to adjust, for example, to hybrid, we'll be ready to, to, to go. So normally, October this year, we want to be in production, uh, and then uh, so far, so good. I was there last week in Savannah, and also we went to our other plant in Montgomery, Alabama. We're ready. And, and t t talk us a bit, does Hyundai have a, a different approach to sustainability um, be beyond, obviously, the contributions to sustainability that your EV kind of innovation is bringing? Yes. <clears throat> so we really want to ensure we are really sustainable. So like, for example, you see a lot of uh, these EV plants, and then the cars come in and out with diesel trucks, right? So we are building the ecosystem to be able to produce hydrogen so that with hydrogen we can uh, fuel, a fuel cell EV trucks, and then those are the trucks that are going to start doing the uh, parts logistics and the vehicle logistics, both inbound and outbound. If you do that, and for example, you add the uh, creation of energy uh, with waste, uh, which we can do, we presented at CES in January, or with plastic, or even uh, better yet with the SMRs, small modular reactors, nu nuclear energy, then you have a perfect perfect cycle of uh, creation of energy, which is green, hydrogen, uh, trucks, battery electric vehicles, uh, so on and so, and so forth. This is a real 100% commitment. So sort of an end-to-end -end strategy. So now, again, let's go back to the consumers. Of, of, and I think everyone reads about the advances in technology, and obviously everyone's been reading and talking about autonomous cars for a long time, first it was five years, then it was 10 years, then it's then longer. And now, now we're, even you, your company has invested in a, a, fl a flying car um, <laughs> um, the t type of technology and company. Tell, tell the people in the room, you know, really, where, how is this going to evolve? Where, wh when are we first going to see the, 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 the first G whiz? Oh my goodness, I can't believe this technology is actually happening. Is there going to be a moment in time when that's, then we're gonna, everyone's going to feel 
Like, oh my God, this is here, or is it going to slowly be introduced across different existing well, products? Like, like everything is going to be a step by step, but uh, there gets a moment that uh, you achieve the critical mass, and then all of a sudden you realize it's there. So if you go today to Vegas, you can drive uh, our uh, Ionic 5s, uh, which are running on the Motional platform, and this is the autonomous driving technology. And the people are saying, is this good, is this bad? In reality, when you're driving yourself, uh, sometimes you're tired, and then you, you just have one dimension. I look forward, I can hear, but I have very limited senses on what's, what's happening around me. With the uh, technologies of uh, videos and uh, LiDAR and uh, uh, radar uh, and laser, you know everything around your car. The car can talk to other car, the car can talk to the infrastructure, and therefore they are more, they are safer. So the cars don't get tired. As an example, the sensors keep working 24 7. They don't drink, right? <laughs> <laughs> so you, they are definitely sa safer. And then the same technology you can utilize in aviation. So Supernal is all, also going to develop this autonomous uh, flying uh, technology, which we are testing uh, as we speak in California. We're based here in. DC. Have you done a test yourself? We, I did yesterday, but it was a simulator. So we're going to have the first prototype flying by the end of this year. What was it like? What, did it, what was the simulator like? Is it, it is uh, really unbelievable. It's really <laughs> unbelievable. It's, um, it, it is, you are like in a cabin, you're like in a plane, and then you see the, the airplane, uh, and then it's reacting to what you do. Uh, and then the good thing is that if you do something wrong, uh, they don't let you do the something wrong. The computer takes over. It helps you. Uh, so it's really fantastic uh, technology, very fast, very very lean. And then the good thing is that all these, the bases, the fundamentals of the of the business are similar, right? So the software de derived vehicles, uh, the software technology is utilized also for for Supernal and for our cars, right? So it's all connected, and that's why <coughs> we decided to get into the Boston Dynamics uh, and into Motional and into Supernal. It's all connected to mobility. Our mission is progress for humanity. And we want to move people from A to C uh, in a very smooth way and safe uh, without any uh, events so that you can get closer to your loved ones without any event. So how, how many employees uh, Hyundai Motor Company or group? So, so we have, well, a uh, Hyundai Motor Group it globally is about 300,000. Okay. In the US alone, direct and indirect, we're 114 today. So, so I, want, I wanted to ask the question to, to, for this follow up question. So, you are um, one of the key leaders of 300 or 150,000 people. Your mission is to innovate faster. You've got competitors like Elon Musk. I mean, we've had a lot of CEOs on stage here today from some of the great companies. Uh, and I, I certainly think you fall into that category. How do you get 150,000 people to constantly innovate and move fast? Well, they are in as fact a leader. As a leader, in fact, it's uh, uh, 300,000. But then the the, the number people. one is, is double. The the number one thing you need to have a, a very very strong leader. <clears throat> and then we have really a strong leader who is our chairman, whom you know very well, Chairman Chairman Chung. And then we have a really strong organization, everyone aligned. Uh, the moment the decision, uh, the, the company takes a decision, everybody is aligned. And we apply, uh, we call it the Pali Pali Midi Midi. Uh, we have really <clears throat> a very strong stretch plan, and then we try to do even uh, faster adaptation. So everybody knows uh, that um, the success is not about uh, staying the course only. You need to be persevering and stay the course. The success is to be able to adjust constantly to what is happening, and there is nobody like our company to adjust to the environment. But is that a cultural, a set of cultural values and cultural behaviors, or is it a set of technocratic processes? It, it is a combination, but it's, it's part of the culture of the company. I think it's part of the country itself, South Korea being such a leading country in the world in terms of technology, in terms of growth. And our company is the largest company in South Korea. It's the biggest example uh, of all that, and our leader even, even more so. We, we do our best uh, everywhere, and uh, let me tell you that it's an undertaking for me. Uh, uh, being the only non-Korean member of the board of our South Korean uh, company. It is, uh, you know, you need to be even faster because you have to hear in Korean, get the translation, <laughs> you have to be fast understanding, <laughs> reacting, I cannot be behind. Does it help that you're Spanish? 
I'm Spanish uh, born, I'm very, very proud, but I'm also an American also citizen, American. so it helps. I think uh, we have a special resilience. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I want to finish on, on just one question, because we're here at the World Economy Summit, and um, much of the conversation is about the state of the global economy, uh, how uh, the rest of the year 2024 is, is how the U.S. economy is doing relative to, obviously, the Chinese economy and some of the larger uh, the EU bloc, um, you obviously operate in all these different markets. Uh, what are you seeing uh, across the, your dashboard of the mm -hmm. 2024 and even beyond 2025 global economy? So we see a lot of uh, things changing <clears throat> and we need to adjust to, to that. So well, what we try to do is to understand uh, what drives that change. Everybody knows about the, the two large conflicts uh, today in the world, right? And then the first one um, in Ukraine and the second one in the, in the Middle East. So what happened with the Ukraine is that a lot of the energy, cheap energy source from Russia into Europe was cut. So then uh, this uh, drove uh, a complete different uh, flow of energy in the world. So the energy from Russia went into China, went into India. Cheap energy, very competitive. So now the Chinese are more competitive and they're producing more vehicles and they're sending them back to, to Russia. Uh, then the Europeans uh, got no energy <coughs> for, many, for many years. They did not invest in some, uh, in some key technologies like nuclear, with the exception of, of France, for example. But then Germany has been a country which has been particularly uh, uh, impacted by the low energy uh, supply that they used to have from, from Russia. So they have to uh, buy from the United States at a higher uh, cost, right? So bottom line, the US has become indirectly a winner of this conflict. I think in China has become a winner. Uh, <clears throat> Russia is now supplying to other countries, so they, they have maintained. So for the time being, Europe has been uh, losing. So, and this we see a little bit in the numbers in, in our business. We just saw today that uh, China announced a GDP growth of 5.3, which is quite, quite a good number, not the one that they used to have 10 years ago, but still a very good number, uh, which shows the, the reality of that market. And then uh, I would like to uh, make the point that the number one sector that has been growing for China is been the electric vehicle uh, sector and also the solar, the solar hmm. panels. So as such, our market, the US, the US market is still Quite, quite positive. It's been growing about 5% so far, which is not bad at all. Uh, everybody was expecting, because of the high interest uh, rates, the market was going to collapse. It's not the case. There's still uh, pent up demand. And we've seen a change in the behavior of the consumer moving into maybe a little bit cheaper cars or more entry cars as opposed to uh, premium cars. Uh, but still, um, uh, let's say, uh, cautiously optimistic uh, in, in America. Uh, and then we've seen also a very strong future uh, growth in India. So we are the second brand in India. People wouldn't know that. People think Tata is an Indian company, is the, is the largest. Well, it's not. So the number one is Suzuki Maruti, Maruti and Hyundai is yeah. the number one in, in India with about 15% share. So this is a growing market where we're doing very well. Middle East, we are surprised that it's not collapsing as everybody thought, it's still giving us relatively good surprise. But as I mentioned earlier, the USA is our most important market uh, today, representing more than 25% uh, of the total business. And we are cautiously optimistic, increasing uh, capacity. If you told me what could you do to, do to do better business, I would tell you I need more production of Santa Fe, I need more production of Tucson, I need uh, more uh, of the electric vehicles that we're going to start producing in, in Savannah. So it's more uh, a race uh, to produce more than uh, anything else. So Great. we have to, to work every day. Well, listen, we've, uh, we've run out of time. This has been a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for coming uh, and spending some time with us. Please uh, join me in giving applause to Jose Munoz. Thank you. Thank you. Please welcome U.S. Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg. Semaphore co-founder and editor-in-chief Ben Smith returns to the stage. Well, uh, afternoon. Th th thank you for taking the time, Mr. Secretary. We were talking before about, you know, we've been trying to will Semaphore into existence as you do a startup, and how your presidential campaign was one of the incredible acts of all time of, of that kind of will. 
Um, but in any case, I hope that's a good thing. You now, and you now, and, and what in your your prize is really one of the most difficult and interesting jobs in government um, as Secretary of Transportation, and one of the hardest. And there's really been, I mean, I, I guess if you're Secretary of Transportation, there's always a run of disasters. But there's been a really, you've had, you've had um, train derailments, doors flying off airplanes, and now a bridge collapse. And I guess I wonder just to start, I assume you get a call 1.30 in the morning on the 26th. Like, what was your first reaction to the Baltimore Bridge? What was that? You know, how does it come to you? Yeah, you know the the last thing I do at night, I put my phones on a dresser across the room, so I'm not tempted to to keep myself awake scrolling in bed. And as I as I kind of pulled up the sheets, I thought, did I did I turn the ringer on on my work phone? I got back out of bed, walked across, <laughs> turned the ringer on, and uh, and then went to sleep. And of course, middle of the night, phone call comes in. Uh, next thing you know, I'm talking to my team, I'm, uh, I'm talking to Governor Moore, I'm talking to the White House. And there is a part of the job that has really been about contending with just different things that happen, whether it's the plug door in Alaska Airlines, the, 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 uh, the uh, incident that happened in Baltimore, or anything else. Our goal is to make sure that we can contend with all of that, but have that account for 49% or less of our time and attention because we are also by design the department that's supposed to be thinking about the longest term, right? We're building things. We, we are almost by necessity making 80 year decisions when we work on a bridge somewhere. Yeah. Even as you're working on an up to the minute basis on things like the day to day responsibilities of the FAA, which handles uh, about 40,000 flight operations every day. I think something that applies to really both of those short term and long term things. I think there's this incredible hunger right now in the country to see stuff get built fast. Josh yeah. Shapiro is going to you know, run for president in four years on the strength of having repaired I-95 I fast. And I'm curious if, um, A, is this bridge going to ruin Westmore's career? And B, you know, is there a role for you in clearing some of the, you know, I think there's a debate about what it is. Is it labor standards, environmental standards, lethargy, the private sector, whatever it is. Is there a role for you? Have you had success in, I mean, in clearing that stuff away so that things can be built again? Yeah, first, first of all, specifically to, to Baltimore, I think Governor Moore has done a fantastic job. And there's always, whether it's with, with Governor Shapiro when I-95 happened or, or now in Baltimore, it, it really is all about the handshake between state and federal. Because with the exception of the FAA, our department actually doesn't run much. Uh, we don't run railroads, we regulate them. We don't run highways and bridges, we fund them. And so the, the puzzle is always, how do we take all of these pulleys and levers of the government, formal ones and informal ones, and use them to help the people who are on the ground, including my, my uh, fellow former mayors or former fellow mayors, uh, to, to actually get these things done. But I think what you're describing is also a much bigger issue and a very real problem, which is the United States takes longer and spends more building big things. And we are in the business as a department of building good things well. One do, way do I you think, think the it's right to blame the Democratic Party for that? No, of course not. <laughs> um, no, and I would add, um, and I'm not being partisan. And I don't even I'm mean just, like right now. I mean historically. I'm just observing yep. that, uh, you know, I seem to remember another administration here in Washington saying they were going to do a big infrastructure package, ah. and it was a punchline, right? Uh, and 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 I would say this infrastructure package got done on a bipartisan basis. So again, I don't mean to be partisan about it, but I will say that people laughed at President Biden. There's a difference between building an infrastructure, basis. passing an infrastructure package and putting a thing out and building a bridge. Yes, right? exactly. So that's what we're in the middle of right now. We got the 1.2 trillion dollars. About half of that is transportation. But if we can be one percent more efficient on a $1.2 trillion package, or let me put it in, in the reverse, if we are 1% less efficient than we should be on a $1.2 trillion package, then $10 billion of value disappears. And so it is critically important to deliver these projects efficiently and swiftly, but it's also critically important to make sure that they happen with integrity. President Biden is very proud of the work that he did during the Obama stimulus package, making sure that waste, fraud, and abuse in that package was, was held to an absolute minimum. The pressure is on us to do the same. And we've already got something like 50,000 projects going on across the country. So we have to be rigorous and meticulous enough that they get done right, and at the same time be swift enough and flexible enough that they get done, period. And there is a lot of muscle memory in federal bureaucracies that is all about making sure nothing goes wrong. 
sometimes to the, to, to the detriment of making sure things happen at all. Getting that balance right is, is really, I think, at the absolute heart of what we do. I put some of the best minds at the Department of Transportation on exactly this question. It can't just be fire and forget. Congratulations, South Bend, Indiana, you got the grant. Uh, we'll call you if you break any laws with it, right? It's got to be working hand in hand with our project sponsors. And remember, we're not the ones procuring or building any of this stuff. We're funding it, we're overseeing it, but we have to help an organization, whether it's an entity like uh, like, like the, the Gateway Development Commission, doing the Hudson Tunnel in New York, which will be one of the biggest public works projects east of the Mississippi in this century. Or whether it's a community like, like Chamberlain, South Dakota, that's got 2,500 people, but also happens to have an airport, which really matters because they use it for air ambulance missions. And their general aviation terminal consists of a mobile home, basically. And we're giving them a six-figure grant to turn it into an actual building. But they've probably never had a federal grant of that type before. And across that whole spectrum, we've got to engage the partners to actually get it done. Now, one other thing I would mention, everybody will say the reason things take long in this country is because we care too much about labor and environmental standards. That cannot be the case because I have seen it done very, very swiftly in places like France and Germany and Spain that nobody could argue that, that Europe, Western European states are less committed to labor yeah. and environmental protections than we are, but they have figured out ways to go more quickly. We've got to do the same. On the, on the, on the, on the agency you, you operate and run, the FAA, um, I'm told that you're the the Department of Transportation Inspector General is currently is now auditing, I think this is news, the, um, the FAA's oversight of 737s and 787s. Is, has, I mean, I guess, will you kind of cooperate with that IG investigation, but also, is that agency just get too close to Boeing? So, first of all, it's very healthy for the IG to be constantly auditing everything that happens across the DOT. That's what they do. And I remember that... There's just a the, coincidence they happen to be auditing this right well, look, now. obviously when something's in the news, they're going to take a closer look, the same way we're taking a closer look at Boeing, mm -hmm. right? We also have a framework created by Congress where uh, not everybody involved in, in the safety process on aircraft design is a government employee. So the way it works is we set standards, and then the company is responsible for meeting them, and then we do, of course, a level of checking to make sure they did. There's a spectrum on how this kind of oversight happens, right? On one extreme... Do you, I guess, do you think that the spectrum is set too close to the industry, too close to the company right now? Understanding that you inherited this, that yeah. this is the framework? Yeah. No, and, and the reason I say that is, or let me qualify that a bit, actually, because we're examining everything that we've done. But what I'll say is, no, it doesn't have to be if we get this right. And that's what was at stake when Mike Whitaker, our FAA administrator, said this is not going to business as usual at mm -hmm. Boeing. We're not even going to let them increase their production unless they demonstrate that they can do it safely. So in other words, you can't just say it's about the structure. We're always going to revisit the structure mm -hmm. from time to time. But it's about what you do within that structure. And are we holding our regulated entity's feet to the fire appropriately, whether we're talking about an aircraft manufacturer or an airline, or for that matter, a freight railroad, which mm -hmm. right now, uh, two of the biggest freight railroads in the country are suing us because we put out a rule saying that on a two mile long freight train, generally you have to have two people on board. That, that, I, I'm not making this up. Uh, that, that, they, they view that as, as wild regulatory overreach yeah. on our part. So th there's always going to be a push-pull with whoever we're regulating, but that's how we establish the safety culture that we have. Right now we're moving in heaven and earth to deal with the aftermath of a plug door blowing out on that airplane because somebody could have been killed. We now need to take that same level of rigor, not only maintain it and up it in aviation, but start applying it in roadway safety, where a number of people equivalent to a fully loaded 737 died yesterday and will again today and will again tomorrow. And it's not headline news at all. Yeah, it's, it's been, and move, moving to, from the planes, the trains, the automobiles here, um, talking uh, EVs. It's an issue that has gone, for, that has polarized so intensely, and I think you're probably the Democratic, Democratic figure, goes on Fox most, has been most nimble in talking to Republicans about some of these economic issues, but I, I mean, I saw Marjorie Taylor Greene, everybody's favorite member of Congress, said the other day that Pete Buttigieg can take his electric vehicles and his bicycles, and he and his husband can stay out of girls' bathrooms, which is just sort of a mishmash of culture. Yeah, war. I don't even know, like, why would I want a vehicle to it just doesn't even... You're going to drive the vehicle. 
You're saying you'll drive your vehicle into the men's room? And is the bicycle in the vehicle? Is the, yeah, yeah, maybe she's saying we should only drive electric vehicles into men's room. I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but, but, but I think the real question here is like, I mean, are you just worried that this is just becoming another one of these partisan issues in a way that will cripple the industry? Look, it is amazing when literally anything can be turned into an ideological or partisan issue. I think the fact that something like public health got turned into a partisan issue cost lives uh, in, uh, in, in the mm -hmm. response and recovery to COVID. But I think it doesn't have to. And, and the good news is they're actually good cars and they're going to save people money. So there are certain forces even today that are in fact more powerful even than ideology and partisanship. And some of those forces are the forces that have made America what it is, which is when a great product or a, a superior product is introduced at the expense of an inferior product, especially as it becomes more affordable, people choose the superior product. And look, there's a lot at stake, not just in converting to EVs. We all know the environmental stakes of that. There's a lot at stake in making sure that happens in the US. The Trump administration allowed China to build a big head start in EVs. And I promise you it's not because the Chinese Communist Party is full of environmental enthusiasts. It's because they understand the economic and strategic value of dominating the market that is clearly where light duty vehicles are headed. I grew up in a city haunted by the spectacle of an 800,000 square foot factory with broken windows looming over our downtown that was just one of dozens associated with the Studebaker car company that went out of business because they couldn't keep up with the times. I know exactly what the stakes are if you have an industry that can't keep up with the Is times. Is this an industry though that can only succeed if you don't let Americans buy superior, cheaper vehicles? And they're talking about this as if, uh, as if this is some newfangled thing that we yeah. made up versus being like manifestly the future of the auto industry. Right. I've got, I think we're out of time. I have one more question for you yeah. as a, I can't remember what it's called, the Amtrak guest rewards thing where you get to go to that nice lounge. But as a, as a you know, charter member, although I never quite get that top status, um, are we going to get those high speed rail cars out like this week, this month? When, when do I get to see one of those things uh, in the Northeast Corridor? And will President Biden be on it? Uh, I'm pretty sure it'll be hard to keep President Biden off of the uh, uh, the newest train car. He was I was in a meeting with him and he was asking so many questions about the tech specs of the new Acela cars that we had to call Amtrak to get the answer. Um, <laughs> I don't have a date for you. That's that that's uh, I'd go to Amtrak for that. But, but what I would say is whether they're talking about the Northeast Corridor or the the uh, project to link Las Vegas to Southern California, we are in for a really exciting period in in high speed rail. I think anybody any American who's traveled abroad. Uh, sees what they have, not just famously in Japan or China, but in, you know, like Italy, and yeah. comes back and says, why can't we have nice things? We're finally changing that. I mean, not overnight, but we're changing that. All right, you heard it here first. You can have nice things. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Please welcome UK Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt, and Semaphore Business and Finance Editor, Liz Hoffman. Chancellor? Hi. 
Hi. Good Thanks afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure to be here. I'm told you have a very busy schedule this week, selling Britain. So I'm glad well, you could um, no, I've fit us in. Squeezed in this. Delighted to be here. Let's start with the, the topic of the day, uh, uh, mobility. UK has some of the lowest subsidies for EVs. has actually diminished them over the last couple of years. Why? Well, we, uh, we want to do what works. And our model in the UK has been driven by regulation. Um, and this year, we have introduced the most ambitious transition to a 100% new sales being electric model by 2035. That transition period started this January. And we have one of the uh, biggest EV markets in the world. We, I mean, we are offering subsidies. We, I think we've spent about £2 billion on, on subsidies. Um, but, you know, if you talk to Elon Musk, the UK is one of his best markets. And uh, so, you know, what we want is, you know, to move to a fully electric market. We've set the date and we've set the transition requirement on manufacturers. And we are making great progress. I'm cognizant that almost every government including ours, has missed almost every target they've set around almost any kind of clean energy. So what's the, what's the, what are the sort of interim goals that you think can get you there? Well, we were the first country, the first major country, to set in law um, a legal commitment for governments to get to net zero, for our government to get to net zero by 2050. Lots of other countries have followed suit. And we have hit our carbon budgets uh, and we are on track, I think, our, for our next carbon budget. We've worked out how we're going to get 90% of the way there. Um, and that's a model that has worked for us. It's uh, a very market-driven model. It's uh, less of a subsidy-driven model like you have here with the Inflation Reduction Act. But I understand why the Biden administration chose that model, because I think it's probably the only one that would get through Congress. Um, but. Um, it's working, and we've reduced emissions now. I think we're the first major economy to reduce emissions by over 50%. France and Germany, 45%. The US, Japan, 25%. Um, and we want to continue to make great progress. Okay. A couple years out from Brexit. For the record, you did not think it was a great idea. It does not appear to have been a good idea. I mean, what maybe is sort of the, the most unpleasant surprise that you've, you've seen play out? Well, I wouldn't agree with that analysis, actually. I think there is, uh, you know, I think you look at the evidence of Brexit. I didn't vote in favor of it, but I've never doubted the UK could make a great success of Brexit. There's absolutely no reason why, uh, with an economy the size of the UK's, we can't be successful as a fully independent country like a Canada or an Australia or a Japan or a South Korea. Um, but it is a very big change, and whether we make a success of it or not is up to us. Um, and you know, I think there are things we have to do to make sure it is successful. But I would just say today, the IMF are publishing its economic growth forecasts. They say the UK economy will grow faster than France, Germany, Italy, or Japan, for that matter, over the next six years. So I don't think it's possible to argue that, you know, the UK has suffered irreversible damage. I think that we have got to make lots of changes, and the biggest single one is on labor supply, because when we were in the EU, the world's largest single market, businesses had access to unlimited European labor. Now, the vote, and it's interesting how you know, the UK was, I think, ahead of other countries, because we recognize that migration is a politically very sensitive issue. There was a time when people used to look at the US and say, actually, the US seems to be a country that's more relaxed about migration. They don't say that now. Um, if you are not going to get unlimited labor from a single market so that, you know, Poles and Czechs and Romanians are able to come to the UK, then you have to say, well, where is that labor going to come from? We have six million adults of working age who are not in work in the UK. At every budget that I've done, I have introduced measures to incentivize them to get into the labor force, including introducing very generous childcare provision uh, childcare is expensive in the UK. I want to make it more affordable. That helps young mums and dads get to work. I want to get people off welfare into work. I want to make sure pension taxes don't incentivize people to retire early in their 50s. I want to help long-term sick and disabled get the treatment they need so they get back to work. So you have to have a plan. We do have that plan, and I think we will make a success of Brexit. Our British friends in the press, make sure that I ask you about 
<laughs> your time in, in Liz Truss's cabinet, which is obviously back in the news. Her book came out recently. Um, to refresh people, you came in basically to do some damage control with the markets uh, after the mini budget. First of all, is Downing Street really infested with fleas? We, we have to know. Um, I, had, I actually uh, live in the flat that Liz Truss lived in and Boris Johnson lived in before that. Um, she was only there for uh, less than 50 days. Um, I had a little bit longer when I knew I was going to be moving in there and I replaced all the carpets at my own expense, vast expense, because it had to be a security cleared company that did it. So um, I'm pleased to say that the Hunt family has not had the flea problem. <laughs> all right. But what's, your, what's the big picture lesson kind of about, you had I think a front row seat to the meltdown really of a, of a right wing populist, maybe argue with some of those, those descriptors, administration and there was a lot of credibility damage done in the markets that's taken a lot of time uh, to, to recover from. So I, we're looking at, a, at an election this year, like what, what should we be thinking about? Well, um, Liz Truss appointed me as chancellor um, and you know, we have very good personal relations. Um, she is very open about the fact that she made mistakes. I would say that some of the things that she was aiming for were the right things. She said that the fundamental existential question for Western countries is how we get healthier growth rates in our economy. I agree with that. Um, and she said that we need to bring down the tax burden. And from a European perspective, you know, we look around the world and you know, I think it is blindingly obvious that um, North America and Asian countries are growing faster and they have a lighter tax burden. And I think that we need to move the UK back in the direction of a lighter tax burden. But she went about it the wrong way. And I think I've shown when it comes to cutting tax, I've made some big cuts in taxation. By the way, they're cuts in taxes paid by people in work because I'm trying to incentivize work, part of that same strategy, I think it's possible to cut taxes without increasing borrowing. And that was the thing that spooked the markets, the idea of taxes being cut in a way that you couldn't demonstrate where the money was coming from. I think we've shown it's possible to do the same thing in a way that works. Ben Bernanke, you just imported, speak about importing labor, you just imported an American to do a bit of a post-mortem on the Bank of England and um, sort of how it screwed up on inflation. Um, you know, noting that it was sort of the first, I think, to recognize that inflation was in fact not transient and to start raising rates is almost certainly gonna be the last of the big banks to start cutting unless something dramatic happens. Do you think he's right that like the entire business of economic forecasting there needs top to bottom redo? Well, Ben is a great import from the US, and we're very lucky to have his expertise. Um, I think the way you phrase the question, Liz, is a, is a little bit unfair. Um, you know, I think banks and forecasters all over the world got the inflation trajectory wrong. And I think we've all learned that inflation doesn't fall in a straight line. We've had numbers today showing UK inflation at 3.2%, which is now lower than the US. Um, and. Uh, Look, I would say that we have definitely got to be better at forecasting. In the UK's case, our big weakness is on forecasting the performance of the labor market, its, its tightness, um, but we've got to be better at that and we want to learn the lessons and Ben's report is gonna be very helpful in doing that. But the bigger picture is that 18 months, you know, the whole of uh, the world was facing a very dangerous spike in inflation caused by this appalling war in Ukraine. And in the UK, it was over 11%. And we are now winning that battle. And you know, at that time, the UK was forecast to have the longest recession in 100 years. We've actually pretty much had a soft landing. Um, we're still creating jobs, 200,000 more jobs than, than we had a year ago. Um, the UK is attracting investment. We're getting uh, greenfield foreign direct investment. Uh, third in the world behind only the United States and China. So international investors, including investors I was talking to in Wall Street yesterday, are voting with their dollars to invest in the UK. And as we discussed, you know, we're forecast to grow faster than any large European economy. So I, I think the picture is much more positive, but of course we need to learn from, you know, where the forecasts were wrong. Is that a helpful, I mean, do you think the Fed should do one? Um, look. I'm going to be seeing uh, Jay Powell later, so um, I'm, I'm not going to offer to do his job for him. I think, uh, I think all central banks have a very difficult job. 
Um, but it is a big improvement on policy making that they do that job independently of politicians. I think people want to know that the path of interest rates is decided on the basis of what is best to bring inflation down and not because of political considerations. And so I think we should all recognize that means, I'm afraid, people like me shouldn't be telling central bankers how to do their job. Fair enough. Not that I don't have my secret thoughts, um, but uh, <laughs> well, I think I need to keep them you've secrets. Seen, seen Powell. Um, you've got a plan to make Britain sort of a, a hub of kind of white collar outsourcing, software development, film production. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that. Sure. I mean, you know, post Brexit, what's our plan for the UK? Um, and, you know, our plan is very straightforward. We want the UK to be the world's next Silicon Valley. Uh, we have the third largest uh, technology market in the world. It's only the third in the world after the US and China, which has a trillion dollar ecosystem. People like Elon Musk say that the two global hubs for AI are San Francisco and London. And um, we have very big confidence that we can deliver. It's a lofty ambition to say you're going to be a Silicon Valley, but we are already Europe's Silicon Valley. Why do we think we can do this? Because outside the US, we have the biggest concentration of financial services. So there are the venture capitalists and banks who are backing the, the tech startups. And outside the US, we have the, um, the most respected universities. So we've got the new ideas and the innovation. And for the UK, it's not just pure tech like AI and quantum, deep tech, those kind of areas. It's the industries that are now being defined by technology, like life sciences, medicine discovery, where the UK um, discovered more vaccines and treatments during the pandemic than any other country. Um, film and TV, which is now really, because of streaming, become a technology business. Clean energy, totally digital. Uh, we are talking about that before. Those are the areas where the UK has real strengths, and, uh, and we're going to make the most of it. Speaking of making the most of it, I mean, one of the reasons that the UK is an attractive market for foreign companies looking for that kind of talent is that the pound is weak, labor is relatively cheap, and you've got a sort of a captive workforce that might otherwise, you know, be more mobile and kind of where they could go on the continent. Is this lemons from lemonade? I mean, I, I understand everything you're saying, but it's, it's a kind of a reflection of the position that the economy is in, no? Um, well, I think if you're... Look, uh, the UK economy has been through a difficult period, like uh, all global economies, but I think we're really turning a corner. And, you know, compared to 18 months ago, uh, the signs are very positive and the growth trajectory is, is very positive. Um, so... Um, you know, why are we attractive? Why is it that, you know, international investors are choosing the UK ahead of anywhere in the world apart from the US and China? I think there are some long-standing things that have made us attractive, um, the English language, the legal system, the fact that we are, you know, probably the most international medium-sized economy. We're genuinely uh, completely neutral as to whether a company is owned by Brits or owned by foreigners. Uh, if you're good and you're willing to invest, we want you to invest in the UK. But we have challenges. And, you know, just like everyone else, we have challenges. What are our challenges? Labor supply is one. Um, you know, making sure that with an aging population, uh, the size of the state doesn't continue to grow so much that it crowds out private investment because we have to have endlessly higher taxes. So we have a big program to improve the productivity of our public services. Um, but, um, you know, we want to offer investors the best of the US, the best of European public service traditions. We want to do both. And there's one more thing, by the way, actually, I just want to say that is, I think, really important this week to say. Um, you know, I think it's great that um, uh, Speaker Johnson says he's going to put a bill on Ukraine to the floor of the House. Um, but Europeans are actors and not just observers in this debate because one of the reasons why it's difficult to persuade Ameri Americans to spend more on European defence is because people worry that Europe isn't playing its part. Now, the UK has the biggest defence budget in Europe. I think one of our biggest challenges now is to persuade other European countries to hit that NATO 2%. If 
all European NATO countries spent 2% of GDP on defence as they're pledged to do, that would be an extra $77 billion spent annually on defence in Europe. There could not be a better or bigger signal to Putin that we will never let Ukraine lose. And more on Ukraine, a couple hundred billion dollars of Russian assets scattered around. What do you think? Should, should they be confiscated? Um, we should do everything we can within international law. Um, it's very tempting when you have these uh, Russian assets to say we should just grab them, look at what Putin's done. But, you know, we should remember that the argument we're trying to win is that the law should count. We don't want to go back to a world in which big countries can just invade their neighbors and get away with it. That's what we had in the 17th century, the 18th century, and Hitler tried it in the 19th century, and we don't want to go back to that kind of world. So what we have to do has to be within international law, but if there's a way that we can do this, and Secretary Yellen has made some very intriguing proposals in that respect, if there's a way we can do it within international law, then we should look at that very seriously. One more quickly, uh, David Cameron visited Donald Trump recently. How, how, are you guys ready for a potential? Like, how are you thinking about this? It's a slightly unusual visit. Well, I met uh, President Trump many times when I was UK Foreign Secretary. Um, and but he was president then. For he was president. <laughs> yes. He was absolutely president. Yeah. And, you know, I think, um, you know, first thing I would say is that the UK will work with whoever is president, and I hope the US president, I think US presidents have shown they're willing to work with whoever is in Downing Street in the UK, because our friendship, our bond, our alliance uh, runs very, very deep. And um, I, I would love to, you know, be in a fly on the wall with that conversation between uh, President Trump and David Cameron, but um, you know, the conversations that I had with President Trump and indeed with Mike Pompeo, who was Secretary of State at the time, you know, I talked about a very simple fact, which was that um, you know, after the Second World War, the UK and the US put in place an international order that for all the problems we see in the world has been quite simply the most successful in the history of humanity. When I was born in 1966, half the world's population was living in extreme poverty, that's an income of less than a dollar a day. It's gone up to $2 a day now because of inflation. But you know, if you're living on less than $2 a day, you are in extreme poverty. That was half the world when I was born. It's now 9% of the world's population. That is because compared to other periods in human history, we've started trading a lot more and fighting each other a lot less. Now, that global order is under threat because of what Putin's done in Ukraine and because sadly China is also going in the wrong direction and all over the world countries are looking at the US and the UK and our allies and saying look are you going to come to the rescue of something that has been spectacularly important for human prosperity and for human peace and uh, we need to play our part and that means not just asking American taxpayers to fund America being the world's policeman. It means partners, friends of America, playing their part as well. And uh, we need to do that. And that's a conversation we would have with whoever was in the White House. We'll have you back in December to talk about it. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you. Please welcome Mexico's Secretary of Finance and Public Credit, Rogelio Ramirez de la O, and Semaphore Senior Editor, Gina Chan. joining us on, I know, a very busy trip for you. Uh, I wanted to just start off right away to talk about, uh, since we are in the, the future of mobility session, talking about uh, Mexico as an auto manufacturing hub, 
obviously through uh, trade agreements like NAFTA and different things that Mexico has done mm -hmm. itself uh, in terms of building up this capacity. You have GM, Ford, many uh, companies mm -hmm. that are building uh, cars in your country. And now uh, China is looking also at Mexico as a possible manufacturing hub. There's companies like BYD, uh, the electric vehicle maker that is looking at that. But you've also had the US and Mexico agree to look at Chinese investments a bit more closely given some of the US concerns uh, about that issue. So I wanted to get your sense of how you view Chinese investments. Is it welcome? Is it something that you are also concerned about as, as the US is? We are mostly committed to North American integration to the extent that North American integration rules permit a foreign direct investment from anywhere else. We're going to be complying. Mexico has as a top priority to be a good partner with North America. Uh, we are aware that uh, ever since NAFTA was negotiated in the first, the first time, uh, the rules of NAFTA were relatively restricted because of national content rules, um, regional content rules were uh, setting a signal, they were sending a signal that uh, we are biasing the agreement towards North American content. <clears throat> Mexico has complied. We will, we will look forward to com continue to comply along these lines. So are, are the uh, US concerns then about Chinese investments, is that a concern that that you also share? Because I, I would imagine foreign direct investment is you know, generally something that countries welcome, but the welcome mat is sort of bigger <clears throat> or smaller, <laughs> depending on where you're coming from. Being a partner of the North American MCA and whatever is the development that the agreement takes over the future months and years, we will accommodate uh, to that. Uh, our foremost uh, priority is to be a good trade partner with those with whom we have signed an agreement. Ever since the first NAFTA agreement, remember one thing, uh, a famous pro US professor, Sidney Weintraub, published a book a marriage of convenience. We, we view uh, our participation in MCA and in all the derivations as a marriage. And we will be respectful of the rules. Yes, you will, you will be a good spouse. <laughs> uh, so I, I wanted to ask also about sort of geopolitical tensions that are sort of top of mind as finance ministers such as yourselves and and others are gathered in Washington. And one of those uh, tension points, and we heard Chancellor Hunt talk about this earlier, is the prospect of um, another Trump presidency. And he's obviously had you know, various things to say about Mexico in the past. We saw um, some plans possibly in the works about devaluing the dollar, uh, which you know, the, the U.S. has also had its own issues with currency manipulation, but is that something that concerns you in terms of any sort of currency manipulation, trying to sort of uh, do things to the value of the dollar to make exports ch cheaper? I realize with NAFTA, you know, some of those concerns may not be as top of mind for you, but obviously you, you have your own currency considerations as well. That's right. We think about every single political risk on the horizon. <laughs> and uh, this is not order, not because we don't want to sleep, but this is because we have to consider all the range of risks 
including currency manipulation and infringement of um, goods, uh, uh, understanding, uh, everything is under the horizon. So uh, we will adapt, we will uh, apply to the rules, we will resort to anything that is within the scope of the agreement. And uh, Mexico has a, an excellent record of uh, uh, encouraging foreign investment, uh, international trade uh, ever since the 1990s. And that uh, is a record to keep in mind as, um, as a country that has the experience and uh, the stance to maintain and to navigate throughout geopolitical risks and uh, events that are not considered part of the basic uh, scenario. Sure. We will be able to navigate rightly. Yeah, and speaking of NAFTA and the USMCA, are you worried about trade tensions at all or, or that being reopened if, if there is another Trump presidency or even under uh, Biden in a second term, he himself has been very uh, sort of pro-labor and you know there's various labor mechanisms in the USMCA. Are, are there any worries about you know some of the rules of the road changing? That's right. Mexico has uh, seen two or three different emphases by different governments in the US, uh, each one with its own uh, content of uh, a new emphasis on labor or environmental or rules of origin or traceability or geopolitical tension. Mexico has that experience. We will be able to deal with them. We already know and have been uh, partners with a Republican government. We keep being good trade partners with a democratic government, including the requests by the labor unions. And uh, we will continue to, to navigate and to confront in a good spirit these uh, situations. We are aware that every situation changes and that every change demands an adaptation, uh, 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 starting with an adaptation in the mind. Uh, and that's where uh, it, it was, it's not going to take us by surprise. Sure. That's what I mean. You, you've been through it before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, on, um, in, in terms of a, another sort of U.S.-Mexico issue, there's uh, been a lot of debate in the Biden administration and in Congress about um, what to do about the situation at the border and trying to curb illegal immigration. There is a sense that you know the Biden administration is considering an executive order that would try to limit those flows. How would that affect the Mexican economy? And are there any things that you would want from the Biden administration if they go down this road, given that Mexico will be sort of bearing the brunt of the burden of some of the costs of having uh, some of these um, influx of, of migrants in your country? With regards to uh, anything that is non-economic, obviously I am not the authority to speak, but what I understand, and uh, it, it is easy to understand, that what Mexico wants foremost is the permanent dialogue, the open mind, to listen to situations, the capacity to react, and uh, the goodwill. We are a country uh, and a government that gives um, a very special uh, value to goodwill. And uh, we have been so far fortunate enough to work successfully with uh, U.S. governments ever since NAFTA was uh, uh, in. 
Yeah, well, would that goodwill sure. include possibly any sort of payments or financial incentives to the Mexican government? You know, in, in Europe, that's essentially a, an arrangement that European countries have with Turkey to take in a, a lot of refugees and, and others. Is that something that Mexico would want to uh, see from the U.S. government if, if you're bearing the burden on your, on your economy? We are realistic. Uh, what is in the tradition of the countries to negotiate, and uh, we don't want to be unrealistic as to mm -hmm. what's in the tradition. And within the tradition, we want to use the capacity to grant each other uh, credits whenever that's uh, possible and to the extent that it is uh, reasonable. And uh, on that basis, we are going to be ready to maintain our level of um, demand whenever that is appropriate and uh, doable. Got it. Great. Well, right. we will uh, be watching this all very closely. Thank you so much, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. <laughs>
and do more, right? I mean, for a long time, they had been given the signal that America wasn't the right place to commercialize their technology. They should take the DOE-backed technology and go to another continent to, to scale it up. Mm -hmm. Today, I think, with the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and Inflation Reduction Act, folks are saying, no, I want to actually scale it up here. And we have 500 new factories that have been announced now mm -hmm. you know, in, yeah. during this first term. Your office, um, before you were there, and the, the Obama administration had this issue with uh, Solyndra, I mean, the sort of famous case that I'm sure people are familiar with. Is that, part, is that one of the challenges? I mean, do you feel like you're working under sort of that long shadow of Solyndra still or trying to navigate? I mean, even, even now currently, I mean, there's been Republicans talking about uh, you know, lo looking more closely into these loans or always kind of looking for the next Solyndra well, I mean, the rhetorical flourish is something I can't really get rid of, right? So people love to call things Solyndra in the same way people add gate to the back of every, right. you know, thing that they do. Right. Um, but I think there's two big things that we did on Solyndra, right? One is that uh, we took real technology risk, which we no longer do, right? So we don't take will it work or won't it work risk. We take, you know, it's perceived to be risky, and then we use the 10,000 engineer scientists and experts on the DOE platform to show us that it's not. Um, and then if, it, if we're not sure it's going to work, then we kick it to uh, other parts of DOE that do demonstration dollars, right, grants. Um, the second thing we did was, the, was we put money in first, right? We now put in money last, mm. right? You have to put the equity in first. And so when you think about all the other deals that you know, went sideways on us, right, which there have been several, um, you know, we didn't get beat up for any of those. Right, and so, and in general, we were able to recover 55 cents on the dollar on the ones that uh, had challenges. Our overall loss rate is around 3%, which is in line with commercial banks, so you can argue we're not taking enough risk. Um, and so, in general, I'd say that while the talking point is real, and I don't know that it'll ever go away, mm -hmm. um, I think that when you think about the risks that we've been asked to take, like the last couple of deals that we've announced is, you know, the reopening of the Palisades nuclear plant in, Michigan, right? Not for the faint of heart, but I don't think we got beat up for it. Um, the Thacker Pass uh, facility in Nevada, again, um, you know, we didn't get beat up for it. So, and even the Viejas microgrid for, you know, uh, our first tribal deal. Um, so I think when you think about, um, you know, the environment that we live in, the congressional offices and others are excited to see money going into their district and family sustaining jobs being created. And, you know, they're always trying to land punches, and, you know, that's okay. Yeah. On the flip side, one of LPO's, you know, great successes over the years has been Tesla, um, which you were an early backer of. Um, does Elon call you to thank you ever? For, Every day. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Every <laughs> single day. Yeah. It's like his morning routine. I'm like, stop it, Elon. Yeah. Enough. Okay, good. That's what I, I was hoping. I hope he doesn't come across as ungrateful. <laughs> um, but, no, but my, my real question is uh, whether, you know, just we're here talking about mobility. Yeah. Since the that sort of Tesla days, how has LPO's approach to um, you know engaging with EVs and the mobility space uh, kind of evolved or changed since then? Well, I think first, like let's let's celebrate where we are, right? I mean, so we provided the essential loan required for you know the Model S to come out and then future models. Um, you know, the the United States hasn't been the world leader in a passenger car. Uh, at least in 40 years that I know of. Um, but in 2023, right, the best-selling car in the entire world was the Tesla Model Y at 1.2 million units. And that was far higher than the next two. Like Toyota, I think the Corolla and then the RAV4 was like 1.01 million units, right? So that was like 20% more for the Model Y, the first year ever that it was electric. Right? And so first, I think we have to celebrate our wins. Right? I think that's great. And then you know, this administration has really dedicated itself to figuring out how we bring the entire supply chain here to the United States, mm. right? some of which is um, focus, and a lot of it which is tools that were provided to us in the Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. So when you think about um, you know, our time in office so far, you know, we've allocated I mean, close to $20 billion now to over 10 deals, right? So cyber resources processing graphite um, in Louisiana, right? Like Rhyolite Ridge, Thacker Pass in Nevada for lithium, right? Um, Redwood materials, Lifecycle uh, for recycling, right? You're talking about um, Cell Link, which, you know, is like the first Model S uh, front seat had 30 pounds of wire in it, right? Just to get all the wire to go everywhere. Their technology reduces that down to one pound. 
And uh, so you well, can think like, you know, the savings are extraordinary. And that's a technology that no one else has. It's still so proprietary that they didn't patent it. It's like trade secret. And so when you think about, you know, the kind of stuff that we have in the supply chain, that really differentiates us with uh, companies from around the world mm. and unlocks electric airplanes, other places where weight is such a huge issue, right? And so when you think about we've got three or four more of those deals coming out soon, um, that entire supply chain is coming here and then it's supported with belts and suspenders, right? So you have 30D tax credit where you know, you don't get that tax credit unless you've got enough local domestic content mm. um, here. And so then that provides a signal to buy from those mm -hmm. folks, right? Um, but also we have a technology lead. So when you think about our battery manufacturing facilities, which we've you know, funded, so Altium and, and then Blue Oval, uh, which is a conditional commitment, um, we have like two or three more generations of battery technology that are gonna just beat the pants off of everybody else nation worldwide. Mm. And we're not sharing that technology for free with those other countries this time, mm -hmm. right? We're going we're gonna to use the stuff that we invented here and actually deploy it here, right? And so I think a lot of people are trying to say, well, why haven't you caught up with these other continents last week? Yeah. It takes like two or three technology cycles for us to show clear dominance, but I think we're on track to doing that. Yeah, that, that kind of goes to the next question I was going to ask is what, I mean, you know, if, if, the, only, if the only thing in, in a sort of vacuum that we cared about was, uh, you know, cutting emissions and kind of getting EV adoption going as quickly as possible, wouldn't it make more sense to just import all this stuff more cheaply from China than to try to stand up this kind of battery recycling or manufacturing in the U.S.? I mean, it, you know, obviously there are people much smarter than me that can answer that question, but like, you know, from my perspective, I think if the American people thought that that we made fossil fuels here and then we imported all green technology from outside, that they would be less enthusiastic around deploying it at scale mm -hmm. or using you know, taxpayer dollars to, to deploy it at scale, right? And so I do think we have to be uh, cognizant of the mandate that you need from the American public to be able to do this. And then it happens to be that everything was invented here anyway. So it's not like, like LFP batteries, which we all talk about with CATL, that was invented by John Goodenough at UT Austin. Mm. It's just that nobody wanted to make them here, so then it was licensed to China, mm. right? And so I just think that when you think about all the stuff that we're so good at, whether it's nuclear technology or solar panels, right? Whether it's, you know, Topcon or, you know, HJT technology, et cetera, all of it was invented here, but we were forced to license it to other continents because we had no interest in manufacturing here. Today, we still have that level of innovation happening here, but now I think we're switching to saying, oh, let's make it here tied to the American worker, tied to the American community. Yeah. Uh, just in the last minute that we have, Jigger, any, any other thoughts about kind of, uh, you know, what are the biggest obstacles at this point that you see for EV adoption in the U.S.? Is it, is it a matter of cost? Is it EV charging networks? I mean, what, what are the kind of key challenges that we have to solve to, to pick up the adoption rate? Look, I think that when you think about people like me who are approaching 50, um, you know, we've driven an intro combustion car for 30 plus years, right? And so I got my license at 16. So, you know, so old habits die hard, right? So I can put in as many EV charging stations as people want me to put in. They still may not feel comfortable because, you know, folks like to drive until that like fuel gauge gets all the way to E. They don't really like to plan. They want to make sure that something's like a half, half a mile away so they can just coast right into it. And so like that's, I'm, I'm not going to change those for folks first, right? Separately, I think that Americans want what they want. And so I think when you think about all the different options that we are presenting to Americans, right, there is the traditional battery electric vehicle. Tesla has obviously um, you know, started that trend, but many others have come out with great technologies, including Hyundai. Um, and then separately, we've got plug-in hybrid vehicles, right? Like my in-laws decided to buy a plug-in hybrid vehicle because it was more comfortable to them. Like plugging in into the garage is super easy for them, right? But if they want to go on a whim to New York City, they don't really want to plan. They don't want to figure out DC fast chargers. And they're still going to reduce their emissions by 95%. So like, I'm okay with that, mm -hmm. right? And so I feel like there's this like religiosity around you must do it this way or else it's a failure or whatever it is. I think what you're going to find is, is that as with all the other scares in the past, right? I remember when the Yugo came here in the 1980s and we were all gonna drive Yugos for $5,000. And then it was like the, ta the Tata Nano was gonna come out, right? It was a $2,500 car and India was gonna eat our lunch and now it's BYD or whatever it is. I think, I think Americans want what they want. They want a high quality car. 
This is where they like to spend their luxury dollars, even if they're buying used or anything else. And I think you're going to find that the cars that we make here are the ones that everyone wants to buy around the world. You already see that with Tesla, but I think you'll see that with Rivian and Ford and GM and Stellantis and others. And it's going to be a fun thing to watch. Yeah, great. Jigger Shaw, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate having you here with us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Please welcome Representative Steny Hoyer of Maryland, Chair of the Regional Leadership Council, and Semaphore Founding Editor-at-Large, Steve Clemens. Pick a chair, any chair. Which one do you like? I'll sit here. I've been trying to change all day. Okay. I'm going to put myself in the center here. Why not? Everybody doing well? How was lunch? Good? Good? You do okay on that? Um, Congressman Hoyer, we've been here all day. I didn't tell him. Mine was okay, too. Yeah? Didn't Where did you me, go? What did you have? <laughs> at my desk. Uh-huh. You're always at your, you're working hard. Let's start with the news. Um, I think it's been a little while, not that long, that Matt Gates, Marjorie Taylor Greene, and Chip Roy all have been a little bit different in the way they were thinking about what the agenda of the Republican Party. They all seem to be now unified with their frustration with um, Speaker Mike Johnson and over the supplemental aid package, $95 billion aid package that may be coming together. Tell us what you know. <clears throat> well, I know they've always been frustrated about everything and yeah. everybody. I do know that. Um, I think that we have uh, a general agreement uh, the speaker, after many months of saying that it was critically important that we move immediately on Ukraine in particular, um, uh, has come up with what uh, I think is his version of what the Senate passed us. And what I mean by that is the Senate passed us a bill uh, with essentially four sections. So we're going to do a bill and we'll do it one section at a time, and then we'll put it together at the end and send it back to the Senate. Um, and that's for his internal politics reason, because there are uh, a, a lot of people in his uh, caucus or conference that are opposed to funding Ukraine, which I think is... Uh, but all of these will come to the floor for a vote, the, the, the according to the present deal. plan uh, is probably on Saturday. Um, I would hope before that, but hopefully... On, and on and the Mike Johnson chapter is the repayable loan. Uh, that's part of... Uh, but it's repayable. It's, it's a forgivable loan. It's a repayable and a forgivable loan. Yes, it's a, it's, it's a forgivable loan. And the forgiveness uh, uh, loan deals with economic assistance, not the military assistance. The military assistance is a straight grant. So on Sunday, is Steny Hoyer going to go on the TV shows here and say that uh, Speaker Johnson caved into the Senate vote completely? No, I'm going to say Speaker Johnson did the right thing. He did a little late, but he did the right thing. We did the right thing, and we're getting money to Ukraine, uh, which absolutely needs it. And the message we have been sending over the months of delay uh, to the authoritarian uh, governments of the world and uh, some of our enemies, uh, Russia, Iran, North Korea, uh, the message we're sending to China vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan were terrible messages. I'm going to say we sent the right message. Right. The U.S. is engaged. The U.S. is sticking with its allies, and the U.S. is stepping up to the plate. I think we should have done it months ago, but we've done it now, and it's never... And if Hopefully, it's not too late to do the right thing. If, if a motion to that, vacate is, is moved against Speaker Johnson, which... You know, I don't know, reading the tea leaves and smoke signals look like it might happen. Would you vote to keep Johnson in place? I, I, I don't want to telegraph that now, but I will tell you this. Mm. Uh, we need to bring some stability uh, to the operations of the House of Representatives. Uh, the, the roller coaster that we've been on with the Republican leadership from the McCarthy's original election, which took 15 votes, to the uh, removal of McCarthy, and then the rejection of their majority leader, the rejection of their majority whip, the rejection of the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, uh, right in a row where they could not elect a speaker, um, sent a message of instability uh, in our country. And I think that's bad economics. I think it's bad international uh, uh, message to send. 
and I think a greater degree of stability and cooperation in the House is absolutely necessary. So I want to get to transportation and I want to get to infrastructure, which you and I have talked about many times, but I've got to ask you about another uh, global question, and that is the Gaza-Israel crisis. Um, we we heard, just heard you know, David Cameron, uh, British foreign minister, is out there saying that he now expects Israel to retaliate directly against Iran. It's the first time these two, well, it may be Israel struck Iran before, but it was clandestinely. But I think when you're kind of looking at that, and you also made comments that made a bit of news about Qatar and Qatar, you know, the ties with the United States need to be reevaluated with Qatar. Are you worried at all that we're right now seeing a significant escalation in the regional conflict around Israel Gaza in a way that Joe Biden has been saying, please don't do it, please don't take this route? Are you worried? Uh, I think all of us are justifiably worried. Um, this is the biggest confrontation we've seen in some period of time, certainly in this century, if you will. Right. Uh, and uh, I think any rational human being is concerned about a conflagration in the Middle East which will spill over uh, and, and involve the United States and other nations as well, as did the actions of the other night. Uh, now, having said that, I think Israel's got to make a determination what it has to do, and Israel will make that determination in the context of all of us having to make sure that other nations know that they will respond to being attacked. Do you agree with Chuck Schumer that it's time for Bibi Netanyahu to go? Look, I don't want to get into that. That's up to the Israeli people. Clearly, what uh, the Israeli people, to get to Netanyahu, went through four elections in mm -hmm. a row. Uh, and uh, nobody could create a coalition. Right. Uh, and I think, uh, I will say that I think uh, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu created a uh, questionable coalition in terms of the policy, good policy right. for Israel, uh, whether it deals with settlements, whether it deals with other matters. I think the, the uh, to some degree they have the same problem the Republicans have. They have a very hard right who will not compromise. They won't compromise with their own leadership. Uh, and so I think in that context, what uh, Senator Schumer was saying, which is accurate, that they have a destabilizing impact on the country. And then just finally on this front, um, your congressional colleague, Chris Van Hollen, Senator Van Hollen, I've talked to you quite a bit about this, um, is, is very open that, that a lot of young Democrats feel a lot of antipathy right now about President Biden and this conflict, and you see in Michigan, Wisconsin, you know, kind of the, the most sort of, you know, in primaries, protests, you know, to express concern about this form. But is, the way he put it was, is, is, is Prime Minister Netanyahu's political needs at this moment undermining uh, Joe Biden's viability in this election? Well, the question you really is, is Biden's stance uh, undermining Kinda. his support? Uh, well, stance, but yeah, but I mean. I mean, you know, that's what we are asking. His, his close hug. I think he's taking a courageous stance. I agree with his stance. Uh, I'm, I'm a strong supporter of Israel. Israel was created by the United Nations in 1948 to give uh, Jewish people who had been savaged for millennia, millennia, I think an awful lot of people in this country do not understand the impact of anti-Semitism and hate and violence directed at Jews over the, over the centuries, over the millennia. Uh, it was created uh, to, as a sanctuary. And unfortunately in 1948, there was a war uh, to see whether or not that could be uh, sustained. And the Israelis uh, sustained it against most of the Arab world. And repeatedly since then, there have been other wars in 67, 73, intifadas, uh, where the, uh, the Arabs have carried out uh, a policy, not, not all the Arabs, right. certain Arab states have carried out policies to uh, uh, eliminate uh, Israel uh, from the land uh, and, and destroy them as a nation. And I think in that, in that context, when you have Hamas, with a charter that says their mission is to kill Jews and eliminate Israel, 
that Israel has to respond. Not only do they have the right to defend themselves, right. absolutely essential that they defend themselves if they're going to survive. Uh, I think that's President Biden's position. Uh, obviously, uh, I think every human being with a moral fiber is concerned when you see children and innocent uh, people uh, yeah. killed in the process of the war's uh, execution. And I think Biden has reflected that. I think we've all sent a message that, look, you've got to be, you've got to be much more precise. I happen to agree with Israel that they need to eliminate Hamas. Right. Hamas is not going to change its philosophy of kill Jews and eliminate Israel as long as they exist. Now, are you going to kill that ideology? No. Some people say, well, you can't kill the ideology. What you can kill is the remaining four battalions right. who carried out the initial uh, and, and have been for decades. So I'm telling my team, put more time on the clock. As I took him off script, I wanted to get to make some news here. Um, so, but thank you so much for this. Your chair of the Regional Leadership Council, you and I have talked a lot about the vital need before these infrastructure bills were passed, uh, before we were from telecommunications to transportation, et cetera. What is your sense of things? I think we had Pete Buttigieg up here a little while ago. And do you think it's rolling out well enough, fast enough? And of course, this is before I get to the bridge, but on the transportation front, where do you think we are? I think we're doing well. I think there are some 4,000 projects that are out. Uh, I think uh, I've had an agenda that I came up with in 2010 called Make It in America. Uh, we were talking about Made in America, and when I said Made in America is what we did yesterday, and Make It in America is what we're doing today and what we'll do tomorrow. This was the, the 117th Congress, the last Congress, and this is my 22nd Congress, was one of the most productive in which I've served. Uh, and uh, it was the most Make It in America Congress in which I've served. Uh, and it's going to have, I think, effect. It's having great effect now. And it's going to have effect for decades to come. Uh, and the statistics bear that out. Uh, we have met with the White House. Uh, we've met uh, around the country. We had 180 events mm. uh, this past uh, week. Uh, not the week before when we were in uh, our districts. Uh, I think we communicated with literally millions of people, either directly or in the press. And I think that uh, the agenda that we have adopted in the four bills, the rescue plan, where we were coming out of the pandemic and we, we help people get out without going through the floorboards, um, mm -hmm. we've done that better than any other country. And then the three bills that we adopted in infrastructure, uh, absolutely essential. Trump had said in 2016, I'm going to invest a trillion dollars in, 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 in infrastructure uh, for four years. Not only did he not do it, but he didn't offer a bill uh, to do that. Uh, but Joe Biden did that, and it's going to make a great difference, and it deals with things more than just hard infrastructure that right. you think of. <clears throat> and then the Chips and Science Bill, what we found out uh, in uh, during the pandemic that America was relying uh, uh, on the unreliable. Hmm. I think Americans were shocked that we didn't make the masks that we needed, that we didn't have the gowns that we needed. Uh, I think Americans were further shocked when the uh, U.S. automobile factory shut down. Why? Because Singapore and Taiwan had shut down their chip manufacturing, and our cars are now uh, chips surrounded by rubber and glass. Yeah, CEO of Intel gave me this chip today. Mm -hmm. So we're making, this is the, I'm, I'm very proud of this chip. I like to show it off. I'm <clears throat> Pat Gelsinger, so we're, we're making chips again, he says. Everybody, show off your chips. <laughs> we all have chips. <laughs> we all wear chips every day. Yeah. Our, uh, everything we use electronically has a chip in it, uh, and it's getting, there are going to be more chips the smarter we get uh, with our machinery or the, Right. The more uh, tenuous we get, <laughs> if we yeah. get more, depending on your perspective. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, uh, we shut down our automobile factories because we weren't making chips. Right. And we invested billions of dollars in making sure that we uh, do chips, and we're giving uh, uh, large companies like Intel that make it billions of dollars. That was the right thing to do, and it's going to pay off in big time uh, in years ahead. And I just hope the Americans uh, get to the concept, not only that the other candidate's not acceptable, <laughs> he says, 
in a bipartisan way. I guess I can't <laughs> say that in a bipartisan way. Yeah. But, you know, understand how critical investing in America was when we found out that there were a lot of things we didn't have that we needed for our national security and for our economic well-being. I mean, you know, Francis Scott Key Bridge, mm -hmm. I'm sure you've been spending a lot of time on that. Yes. Um, you know, right now I look at it, I, I, I have been over that bridge a, a million times, and, and it's, uh, is it a dagger in the heart of Baltimore, number one? And number two, um, assuming it's going to be built, brought back, has it accidentally, has the, has the Dolly ship unintentionally exposed a vulnerability about bridges. I also go over the Bay Bridge all the time, Chesapeake Bay Bridge. And, you know, will, will, are, we, are we facing potentially a new national security risk in our bridge infrastructure? Um, well, I certainly think it's, it's uh, you know, tugged us on the shirt sleeve or the, or the skirt or whatever they tugged on to say, hey, you've got a problem. Mm. Uh, now, the problem comes from a 987-foot ship piled high, I don't know why they don't tip over, but they don't, uh, 17 stories high, uh, weighing, I can't know the number of right. tons, I probably could look it up, but uh, that hit the bridge strut. And nobody contemplated, a, a, first of all, at the time the built, bridge was built in the 70s, nobody contemplated ships this big. Right. Uh, and now we have uh, essentially huge ships, huge weight, and in this case, apparently lost power mm. and lost the ability to steer the ship. It's, I, I, make, I, I think to myself, uh, I don't know that it happens in my, in my current car, but my last car, when the motor went off, you could hardly turn the wheel because the power steering was out and you couldn't work. I presume that's essentially what happened. And we have to now have an understanding that may happen. And do we need some more protections? Do we need buffers? Do we need something to slide the ship off? Now, very frankly, a ship of that size hits a strut that's you know planted in the in the in the in the sea, some depth. Well, that's an accidental one. I'm worried, purposeful. Yeah. You know. Well, wh whether it's purposeful or accidental, it, it would have had the same effect. Uh, obviously, this was accidental. Um, but, you know, the, the good news is it's not going to, uh, if it was a dagger at the heart, the heart, the dagger is going to be taken out by the end of May. Two more quickies um, before we go on. I really and we're going to go on and, and yeah. we're going to grow. Why do you think, I mean, you and Speaker Pelosi, Nancy Pelosi, were such an incredible duo who under, you know, in a way you understood your, your caucus, you know, these various issues. What's going on that it seems that President Biden and his team are not getting the credit for the massive investments in infrastructure, um, chips? I mean, it doesn't seem to be a lot of enthusiasm, at least as expressed in the polling. Is it a marketing problem? I mean, what are the issues out there if you were to give the White House some advice? Well, we've got a very significant problem. People are going to the grocery store and the gas station every week. Mm. And the message they get every week, I, I'm not going to read these statistics, uh, but they're good, yeah, interesting. They're, they're better. Uh, we're at a GDP growth of 2.8%. Uh, Germany is at minus 0.3%. Right. Uh, Japan is 1.9%. Uh, Canada is 1.1%. Great Britain is 0.5%. This economy is really good, but inflation continues to grip us, particularly as it relates to food and, ga and gas is now up. You know, I was getting it for 339, now it's 369 in, in Southern Maryland. Uh, and that's what's happening. People say, oh, you give me these statistics, and oh, that's great, the GDP is great, but by the way, the eggs that I'm buying are much more expensive right. than last week. And that's what's happening to really convincing people that things are as good as they are and are going to get better because of our investment. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, we are also challenged by the fact that in light of these statistics, people who know, ought to know better are saying this economy is terrible. The Biden economy is terrible. That's baloney. It is error. And because the economy is a lot about psychology, not about reality, but psychology and uh, uh, concept, conceptual. Uh, and people think that, you know, when they go to the gas station, I, yeah, I'm having a hard time 
supporting uh, my car and getting gas that I have to go to work on. Right. Uh, not work on the car, but work, get to work. Um, and that's a frustration. Let me ask you. Because the statistics and the reality is so good in terms of what we are doing and investing in America, how well we came through the pandemic, better than anybody else in the world, right. and how uh, we're doing better than anybody in a place in the world. And they have inflation as well. It's not like, you know, we're only, the only ones afflicted. Thank you for this. And the last question, um, we're seeing exposed in broad daylight um, the rift between different factions of the Republican Party in the House. How are the rifts inside the Democratic Party in the House? Well, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because I would have mentioned it when you talked about Nancy and me and Clyburn. Uh, the most productive Congress in which I've served was the last Congress, 117th, right. and I've just talked about all those. We had a four-vote majority. Four. Now, some people make an analogy incorrectly between the Freedom Caucus in the Republican Party and the Squad. They think they're the same. They're not the same at all. Because if, if they were the same, there were eight people, maybe nine people in the Squad, they could have defeated every rule that we offered because we didn't get any Republican votes. They didn't do that. Why didn't they do that? Because although they had differences on how far you go or how, who you advantage or this, that, and the other, they wanted to see the government successful. Mm -hmm. And so, although it wasn't everything they wanted, they voted for the rule, even if they voted against the bill. Uh, and we never had more than four votes to lose, and we never lost four votes. We didn't offer a single rule uh, that was defeated. Uh, and that's because the, the, the psychology uh, of the, the Democratic Party, when Nancy and I and uh, Clyburn were leading it, was we want to get mm. action done on, for the people. Now, that might sound trite, but that's why we didn't lose votes just over differences that were sometimes substantial, but ultimately we created consensus and we move forward. Uh, you, well, have wanna... a, you have a faction in the Republican Party, as all of you have seen on a regular basis, which is why it took 15 votes to elect McCarthy, why they rejected uh, their majority leader their, uh, after McCarthy was removed. They rejected their majority leader, the majority whip, the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, uh, Jordan, hmm. right in row. They're a very deeply divided party, right. uh, philosophically, politically, and they have a faction that uh, is unprepared to compromise. Yeah. I just want to say Leader Hoyer has been serving Maryland in the country since 1981, and I'm very grateful that whenever I call, we've been carrying on for most of that time a great conversation between ourselves. Can, can, oh, I can, want to say thank you Can you give so me much. two more minutes? Yeah, go, go ahead. Uh, some years ago. My, my, yeah, I mean, we're at zero, but go ahead. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> Some years ago, I want, I want to tell all you because this is an economic yeah. forum and, and I'm, I was the majority leader of the House yeah. for the Democrats, and I want to give these statistics, and you're all experts, you're very smart, you can look this up. I asked my staff, and along working with Alan Blinder uh, from uh, Princeton right. University, uh, to put together uh, 1949 to 2023 the performance under Democratic presidents and Republican presidents. Ooh. Okay. And I'm going to give you a copy of this. Okay, good. There you go. Thank you. I'll, I'll put it out to all of you, okay? You, but <laughs> but this I, is, this just because I think it's stark. Uh, 1949 to 23, uh, Democrats were president 35 of those years. Now I think we're going down to 36 with Biden. Uh, and uh, Republicans were president for 40 years. Right. Real GDP growth. These are averages, obviously. Do short form here. Okay. GDP growth, 4% on Democrats, 2.6% on Republicans. Stock market, 11.1% average increase, 56 under Republicans. These are, this is a 78-year average. Uh, if you put $10,000 and invest it on Democratic presidents right. only and 10000 uh, under Republican presidents only, and you're right. going to find this. Listen to this figure. Uh, at this point in time, your $10,000 under Republicans for 40 years would be worth $81,963. Under Democrats, for five less years, 
$374,444. You look it up. But what that is a, a demonstration of is the confidence of Americans during Democratic presidencies. Uh, now, total jobs, and you're gonna, hopefully you're gonna put this up on the, total jobs over those 78 years. Republicans, 32,571,000. You think not bad? Under Democrats, 32,000 under Republicans, 79,744. 79 million. Mil million, excuse me. This president himself has created 14 million, 15 million. Now, let me say this. Presidents don't create jobs. Congress don't create jobs. Private sector creates jobs. What we do is create an environment right. of confidence or no confidence. And that's what makes the difference. I won't go into the other statistics, but they're all the same. The only well, one that's close is pro productivity growth, interestingly enough, which is 2.19 for Democrats, 2.16 for uh, Republicans. So the product productivity rise was about even, but that's really the private sector that does that, in invents things, gets a better manufacturing way to deal. Now, he wants to kick me off, but I was glad I got that opportunity. <laughs> Thank you all very Thank much. You all. <laughs>Oh, hi, there you are. Um, so Andrew, I want to start, it's been about six months since Uber and Waymo got together and started offering taxis with no drivers in Arizona. So I'm wondering, what are you noticing that people like about driving in a car with no driver? And what are they not like? What have you found? Yeah, I mean, it's been an exciting six months. And uh, I, I think what we've found is it's it's kind of amazing how quickly something extraordinary starts to become ordinary for people. Uh, you know, we're bringing Waymo's technology to the Uber platform, and people are making it a part of their everyday life, just like Uber today is a part of their everyday life. Uh, we've completed tens of thousands of trips uh, with Waymo on our platform in that time. Uh, we're seeing rider ratings uh, at about 4.9 stars, which is sort of in the ballpark of what we see from human drivers. And frankly, we're giving people a choice. So uh, we're seeing not everyone's ready and uh, we give folks a chance to opt out uh, before they're, they're given a autonomous vehicle. Um, those that take them tend to love them. And we actually give those folks a chance to, to uh, in our settings, select uh, a preference to get matched with an autonomous vehicle. And those that aren't ready, that's okay too, because we, we operate a hybrid network. So, uh, so far so good, we're now 24 seven. And again, the, the extraordinary becomes ordinary pretty quick. But do the robo-taxis rate the passengers, like the human Uber drivers? <laughs> the the robo-taxis do not. Uh, you know, we may be talking about AGI or something like that <laughs> today, no. And what about, you're doing uh, food to the Uber Eats as well, right? So Yeah, for, for Uber Eats, like, the, the experience is very similar to how you might think about ordering food delivery today, um, or even the, the sort of experience I just described, right? So, you know, you, you choose a restaurant, uh, put your order in. If it's in an area and at a merchant where we can send an autonomous vehicle, you'll get a prompt saying, you know, is it okay if we send you an AV? Uh, if you choose yes, then when the, the vehicle gets there, uh, you're notified to bring your phone out to unlock the vehicle and take your food. Uh, you know, the, the real life implication of that is uh, you have to walk, you know, from your couch to the curb, uh, which is different than maybe if the courier puts it on your doorstep. Uh, but the benefit is actually you save the tip. So, you know, these are the things we're learning. We're seeing what people like. But overall, it's magic. All right. So no tips and no bad ratings. That's good. I like that. Um, I, Ryan, I've, I've ridden around in a Waymo taxi around San Francisco for about an hour. And it's, it's kind of amazing how quickly you get used to it and sort of forget that you're in this robo taxi. But how do you get people around the country, around the world, comfortable with the safety of these things? And, and what do you do if and when, I assume at some point in the future, 
you know, something bad happens, someone, someone's hurt. Yeah, I mean, we spend a lot of time uh, educating people, so anywhere from potential riders to you know, regulators on how our, our driving technology is safer than, than a human driver. But we know that all of those numbers, while they're very important, they, they, you know, they only go so far in telling that story. And so word of mouth is a big part of, you know, of, of what, we, you know, what happens out there. So if you have a friend or family member that takes a ride, we usually see some you know, um, you know, uh, p encouragement there uh, for people to take um, rides. And then I focus a lot on the user experience. And so I've spent maybe, I've probably done hundreds of rides with people who are riding in an autonomous vehicle for the first time, really trying to cue into you know, what are their questions, what are their you know, concerns about, and then how do we kind of you know, work through some of those things in the user experience. So there's a screen that you see that's in the car during your ride. You can see what the car is able to see. And in some cases, you know, if the car's yielding to something, we let you know that. So it's about kind of being transparent and having that that conversation. Um, in terms of you know when something goes wrong, you know, safety is a first principle for us, and so we work very hard to make sure that um, you know that things don't go wrong. So our driver is very capable of avoiding a lot of situations, and when a crash does occur, um, making that crash you know less severe. Um, at the same time, you know, we do know that those things are, you know, are going to happen. And so we invest a lot of time um, in the community uh, and a lot with um, law enforcement um, individuals to really make sure that we have a robust protocol in place and that we're very fast and transparent when it comes to communication, you know, in those events. Yeah, and we saw how that worked out for crews, right, where some details were held back and now they're not, they're not operating. It can, it can just take one incident and it's all over. Yeah, exactly. I mean, trust is, I think actually most people experience Waymo for the first time when you, when you share the road with a Waymo in your community. So whether you're a driver of a car or you're a cyclist or a pedestrian, that's usually your first interaction with Waymo. And so we even think about those early days when we get into a community and make sure that we're building that trust. It's, it really is about trust building. And you're right, it can just take a moment to really kind of erode that trust. You know, this San Francisco, now, and especially when Cruise was still operating, it, like especially at night, it was like you, you know, the whole road was taken over by these robo taxis. I mean, it just seemed like they were everywhere. And they kind of are with just Waymo. Why aren't they in every city? I mean, what's, what, why is it a technological hurdle or is there sort of a, regulatory thing? Yeah, so we're doing tens of thousands of trips every week right now. We're in Phoenix, we're in San Francisco, we just started up in Los Angeles, and soon we'll be in Austin. And so we're very focused on those four markets. We would say that we have solved the technical challenge when it comes to fully autonomous driving. And now what we're working on is how to scale up that technology. So a couple things. I, I mentioned trust. And so building that trust takes a lot of time. And we're very deliberate about that. So as we go into different markets, we want to take the, the time it takes to really kind of build that trust. Again, not only with the residents of a city, but also with you know, city officials and you know, law, law enforcement officials. Um, and then at the, at the same time, there's a cost implication as well. So our next vehicle platform that's under development right now is going to be a step change in the cost um, that it takes to bring our, our Waymo driver um, you know, to more people in, in more places. And so it's that combination of, you know, of, of vehicle platform cost and making sure we take the time to build trust that are really you know, where we're focused now. So, and may, maybe on the, on the economics question, I can turn to Andrew, uh, if he's still, yeah. Um, do you, how do you, what, how does it break down? Like, how much of, of it is the driver cost? And is there kind of like a technology cost curve here where eventually robotaxis will be, you know, inexpensive, like less expensive than public transport? Like, how, how's that gonna work? Yeah, I mean, I think broadly, there, there's definitely a curve, right? And with scale, cost will come down both on the vehicle platform, but also just the cost to, to serve as uh, robo taxi operations get scale and, you know, bring down defect rates and lower all the fleet management and asset costs and all, the, all those types of things. So, you know, broadly, we think costs do come down with scale and we think long term AVs are going to be cheaper than human drivers. Um, it does, you know, this is creating economic value. So you'll see the pool of, of available rides expand massively. So the addressable market will grow. Um, I think ultimately what you'll see is more people have access to safe, cheap, efficient transportation. 
massively increases our TAM, massively increases Waymo's TAM. And I think ultimately what it'll do is reduce people's uh, dependence on private vehicles, right? Individual car ownership is in some ways a scourge on cities. Uh, and certainly we know the congestion it brings, but also a bunch of other knock-on effects that cities have to wrestle with. If we can move people from individual car ownership to mobility as a service and AVs drive that because of the cost benefits and the safety benefits, frankly, I think that's going to be really, really powerful. In the near term, what that will mean, and both, I think both in the near term and the medium term, is many more rides happening overall in sort of ride hail networks. And that means there's going to be a need for more human drivers and more AVs. I think in the very long term, you know, you will need less human drivers, but I think in the medium term and the short term, it actually grows the pie. And I think that's a, a really great thing because the reality is for some time, there's going to be a hybrid network needed, right? You're going to need a mix of human drivers and AVs for a whole host of reasons, meeting peak demand periods, weather, locations, density, cost, et cetera. Um, and so I think it'll create more opportunity and really what, what this will take on is the individual car. So what's happening around the world? Where, where are people receptive to this and where are they fighting against it? Either, probably either of you could answer this question, but. I mean, we certainly have aspirations to you know, bring our technology to more people in more places. I would say right now though, we're laser focused on these first four markets in the US. Um, and then, you know, again, we kind of are very encouraged, you know, by, you know, some of the early conversations, or, you know, around that. I mean, what about, like, Asia? I mean, China, for instance, a huge, you know, they're huge into this technology, right? And that seems like a good proving ground for it. Um, because, the, you know, you, can, you have this central government that can say, okay, we're going we're gonna, to, you know, open the roads to this. We're going to create all these safety. Do you, do you think that's, do you think we'll see this more, you know, this happen more quickly in China, perhaps? I think there's going to be pockets globally where, where you see this happen more quickly. China's got a huge amount of investment pouring in. Both the OEMs and the technology companies, obviously, they, they have tremendous government support, but also large budgets. Um, but I also think you're going to see countries, uh, you know, outside of the region uh, that are keen to embrace this and sort of leapfrog uh, in, in a way with their economy. Um, you know, we, we see gov like governments, of course, have some have concerns, um, but I think many more globally actually are excited to bring the benefits uh, of this technology, especially places where there's meaningful investment in new infrastructure that I think is well suited for AVs. So I think I think this is global, not a, a U.S. phenomenon. Um, we just launched our first partnership outside the U.S. in Japan. Uh, you know, when you talk to Japanese stakeholders, there's interest there because of like the uh, demographic and labor challenges in that market. So I, I think we're going to see this be, be a global thing. There'll be players that are global. There'll be players that are local. Um, but, but, you know, cities around the world all have to solve the same challenges. And I think this can, can meaningfully help do so. I think there's probably, I'm guessing, some skepticism in this room. You know, we don't see these in D.C. Um, people have been promising, you know, you're going you're gonna to own a robo, you know, self-driving car uh, since like 2015. Can you, are there any concrete, can you give me like a concrete prediction, either of you, on, you know, when is everyone here going to be taking driverless taxis? Well, it, I mean, if, if you find yourself in Phoenix or San Francisco um, or LA, you know, or, or you know, soon Austin, um, you'll be able to do that. So, I mean, at least I know I'm very fortunate. For me, living in San Francisco, I, you know, Reed and I were talking about this bef before we came on. I take, you know, probably in the neighborhood of 10 trips a week. And so it's very much, and, and I see that, you know, as, as we look at our writer base as well, um, you know, as Andrew was mentioning, you have a lot of households where they might have just one car, but, you know, using ride hailing, you know, like whether it be Uber or Waymo, it kind of is beginning to sort of, you know, serve the need of that second car, you know, in the household. And so we, we, there are a number of people that are using us already. I know it sometimes can not feel like that, um, but uh, yeah, it's, it goes back to the, you know, building trust and we want to be very deliberate and careful about how we roll out and take the right, you know, amount of time to, to do that. Okay, well, we're out of time. I'm still on the wait list for Waymo taxis, so hopefully I'll get off that wait list. But um, thank you so much. This is interesting. I hope, uh, I hope we see these things happen quickly. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, great to be here. Thank you. 
Please welcome Shell USA President Gretchen Watkins. Semaphore Climate and Energy Editor Tim McDonald returns to the stage. Okay, great. That was really interesting. Um, I'm Gretchen. Thank you so much for joining us here. We're really happy to have you as part of this conversation. Obviously. Um, you know, oil and gas companies are critical to the future of mobility. You know, you guys, this is intersects everything we're talking about here has a huge impact on your business, and you know, you guys are, are uh, contributing in a lot of different ways to kind of innovating what that what that future looks like. Thank I, you. What, one thing I wanted to ask you about to to start was, which we were chatting about backstage. I think for a lot of Americans, especially when they they think about mobility, first thing that comes to mind is the price of gas at the pump. Um, what are you sort of watching with all of the geopolitical volatility that we have now between the Middle East and Ukraine um, and sort of, you know, do, do you see that kind of volatility continuing and, and what's your outlook for, for, you know, gasoline prices as we go into this election season, especially in the, in the U.S.? Yeah, I th we're, we're of course always watching it um, and uh, we've got customers all around the world and so we want to make sure we can meet their needs. Um, with whatever kind of energy they need. And so when you have geopolitical events, uh, it can cause disruptions to supply, uh, it can cause disruptions to demand as well. Uh, certainly the last big disruption we saw was Russia's invasion of, the, of Ukraine. Um, many countries like the United States said we don't want any more Russian um, hydrocarbons. Uh, many companies pulled out uh, immediately out of Russia. Shell was one of them. Uh, we exited the country. Um, and that took a, a number of months to rebalance um, the energy system, if you will, as, uh, as, as we moved um, hydrocarbons to places uh, that ha we hadn't had to before because of, because of that rebalancing. Mm -hmm. We're not seeing um, as much of a disruption right now based on you and I were talking about the Middle East, um, but that could change. And so I think we're always um, prepared to respond when we need to. Um, and, you know, look at, look at the pandemic. Uh, also was a huge disruption to the whole global energy system when all of a sudden most people in the world stayed home and didn't, didn't move, didn't get in their cars, didn't get on planes, get on, didn't get on trains. Um, and so you, you, we will continue to see more of those. And, and I think as, as Shell, we look to be a leader in the energy transition. Those also are um, hindrances or maybe obstacles as we move towards a cleaner energy economy when we have disruptions like that. But we're going to continue to have them, so we need to be ready for them. Yeah, definitely. Let's stay on this energy transition topic. And uh, Shell made some adjustments to its uh, near-term emissions targets uh, recently. Can you, can you talk a little bit about kind of, you know, what you're trying to accomplish in the near term on, uh, on, on your climate targets and, and how that's been evolving. Yeah, Shell, Shell is a company that's been for over 100 years supplying energy to uh, people all over the world and we are gonna continue to be uh, that kind of a company. Now we're going to be also a leader um, in the energy transition and what does that mean? Um, well it means for sure we're gonna continue to supply hydrocarbons um, in various places but we're also gonna be supplying more and more um, cleaner, uh, low and no carbon uh, energy, whether that's renewables or um, biofuels or um, sustainable aviation fuel, um, or just reducing, finding ways to reduce our own emissions or others' emissions. Um, so all of that is, is certainly part of that. Um, we have recently come out with a um, refreshed energy transition strategy. Um, there's a couple things to note in that. Um, first of all is that we set a target to um, reduce our scope one and two emissions. What is that? Those are the emissions that are generated by fuels that we use at our plants um, by by 30 um, by 50 percent by 2030. Uh, we're already 60 percent of the way there, so I, I see that that's we've got line of sight to hitting that. The other thing we've just done that I don't think any other company has done is we've set a scope three target. Um, scope three are the emissions generated by oil products that our customers use. Um, so we're now looking at um, reducing by 20 percent our scope three, the, the emissions from the oil products that we uh, sell to our customers by 2030. So that reduction, of course, is not a um, with completely within our control. Um, it means we need to work with our customers. It means we need to provide more low and no carbon fuels to them. Um, and the other thing that we've said is that natural gas plays a very important role, and we continue to, to believe natural gas um, is very important also in terms of accelerating the energy transition. Do, the, the way that you have these goals laid out at this point, I mean, do, do you see the company as being 
uh, within the trajectory for the Paris Agreement climate goal of, of two degrees Celsius? Or where, where do you kind of fall in, in that range? So we have a, a, a very clear goal that we've had for years that we will, as a company, be net zero by 2050. Um, and that very much is aligned with, with Paris. Uh, and, and one of the reasons why we've set these other uh, ambitions by 2030 is so that we're not just kicking the can all the way down the road to 2050. So 2030 is uh, is pretty much right around the corner. Um, so if we don't have plans in place and we're not taking actions right now, which we are, um, you know, and we you can see through through our emissions reductions, you know, we, we won't hit that 2050 net zero goal. Yeah. Um, can, can just since we're here we're here talking about mobility. Um, you know, and you know we've been hearing a lot about autonomous vehicles, electric vehicles. I mean, do, does Shell see? And do you see electric vehicles as a threat in some way? I mean, we're we're seeing a lot of uh, oil demand be displaced uh, because of electric vehicle adoption. How does that affect your business? We're actually really excited about electric vehicles, and we're actually the largest electric vehicle charging company in the world. Um, today, we have 50,000 um, EV charging stations all around the world. Um, here in the US, we have 3,500 uh, EV charging, and we're going to be doubling that in the next two years. Um, by 2025, we will go from 50,000 to 70,000 around the world. Um, EV vehicles are growing at a, a very significant rate. Um, particularly in China and Europe, but also here in the U.S. And so we absolutely don't see it as a threat. We see it as an opportunity. Um, Even the loss of the, the sale of that, of that, you know, gasoline or, you know, the oil that's displaced by, by that demand is not, a, not too much of a threat there? Or? No, no. One of the things I would say is that as we've been moving through, and the energy transition is one of those things that's like, it's happening right now, right? It's not tomorrow or next year or 2050. It's happening today. And as we've moved through the transition over the course of the last few years, we've realized that there's some things we're really good at, and there's some things that actually we're probably not as good at as other companies. Um, but one thing we're, we are really good at is we've got, we touch 33 million customers a day around the world. Um, and so if we're touching that many customers, why shouldn't we be offering them lower carbon opportunities like EV charging? And so we've actually, in the United States, um, almost in our entire retail system uh, was franchises. So we didn't own them. Um, we, we had a relationship with, uh, with owners that use our brand, and we obviously have a relationship with them. But we've just, over the last couple of years, we've started buying back uh, some of those stations. So we now own about, I think, about 300 company-owned, company-operated um, shell stations around the country. And what does that do? That allows us actually to install EV charging much more rapidly. Um, and we've bought a couple of EG, EV charging companies. One's called Volta, which you might have seen around. They're at a lot of malls and uh, various places. And so we've got a couple different technologies that are able to be rapidly deployed, and we've got the ability to do that now um, more seamlessly with some of these um, owned owned retail sites. Okay, that's really interesting. Uh, just to uh, pivot slightly, I, I was wondering if you could say a little bit about um, uh, where you see the uh, LNG market evolving. I think we talked about this before. And kind of, you know, wh what's your view on how that's going to change in the future? And d does this pa this kind of pause that the Biden administration has put in place on uh, permitting for new uh, LNG export facilities? You know, how, do, how are you kind of calculating the, your business to, uh, around that, and what, what effect do you think that's going to have? Yeah, LNG is um, is absolutely one of the most critical parts of the uh, of the energy transition, and we are the largest marketer of LNG in, in the world. Um, and so what do we think about when we think about LNG? Well, a few things. You know, first of all, um, it is absolutely an accelerator of renewable energy. And how does that work? Well, when you think about wind and you think about solar, um, those can't be 24-7 sources of energy yet. They probably will at some point. They will at some point. But battery technology has not allowed us to use that, them 24-7 at scale yet. So well, how do you fill in the gaps? You use natural gas. So that's one way that we're able to accelerate renewable energy. Um, the second thing about natural gas is it is significantly lower in emissions um, than coal. And if, it, if you stack the United States up against other countries around the world, we in this country have um, reduced our own emissions by more than any other country over the last decade. And that's because most of our power plants have switched from coal to natural gas. Um, now, is that the end game? Absolutely not. Do we need to continue to ramp down on natural gas and ramp up on renewables? For sure. Um, but the other thing I'd say about natural gas or LNG in particular, is that um, because it's very transportable um, and because 
infrastructure exists in a lot of places, it actually allows countries and people that may not today have access to um, rateable, uh, reliable, and affordable energy, it, it allows us a, a simpler way for people to access energy. So when you think about the Global South, um, a lot of the Global South has been pulled into the energy era uh, because of LNG and uh, very, very much see it continuing to, to, play, to play that role because mm -hmm. we believe that this transition needs to move everybody forward, not, not just wealthy countries or mm. wealthy people. Do, do you feel like the, the, this pa the Biden administration pause is kind of counter to that? Yeah, goal then, or? I would, I'd say a couple of things about the pause. I think, first of all, um, what we've heard from the government, what I've heard from the government is that there, it, it is a pause. Um, and so I think if it's a pause, meaning it, it, we, it gets lifted in a reasonably short period of time, um, you know, it won't have a huge impact because it is uh, about permitting terminals that are uh, going to be built the next decade. Um, but, but, you know, if it lasts longer, it could start to have an impact. You could start to see an impact on prices. But the other thing I would say is that it's just an indication of instability. And so, you know, when the government suddenly sort of dips into the markets and says, oh, we're going to stop doing something, um, it, it sends a signal, particularly to other countries, like, well, why, why would I buy LNG from the United States if I can buy it from another country where I don't have that interference and I don't have to worry about things stopping? So it's not a helpful signal, I would say, but certainly what, what we've heard is that there's a need you know, to understand the domestic supply of gas and the and import export balances. Okay, let's, let's get that work done and, and let's, let's you know, lift that pause and move on, do what we need to do and, and move on. Yeah, right. Um, Shell, uh, is uh, in the process of appealing this uh, ruling against the company in the Netherlands. Um, you know, we were talking about this a bit backstage as well. I mean, can, can you say a bit about where you see, and there's, there's a whole lot of litigation happening all around the world against oil companies. Um, what kind of risk do you perceive uh, from, from sort of climate-related litigation? How are, how are you guys preparing for that? So the, the, the Dutch court case that you're referencing specifically, we just appealed it uh, last week. And why did we appeal it? Well, because it was a, a a single case against a single company um, aimed at, at mitigating climate change, and we very much don't feel that the courts is the right place to do that. Uh, and a single company being penalized is also not going to result in the, the outcome that I think is, is we're all after, which is reducing our emissions, staying within the, the, you know, the goals of Paris, and becoming a net zero uh, economy. So, we didn't think that was the right thing, uh, didn't think it was fair, um, and laid our case out on that. Mm -hmm. you know, that said, uh, it, it, it is, you know, certainly um, brings back to the forefront the commitments that, and the ambitions that we do have, and it means that, you know, we need to, we need to keep holding ourselves to account for that. Um, there's other litigation in other places, and, you know, we would much prefer to have lines of communication wide open, because if this transition is going to continue to move and it's going to even accelerate, which would be great, it's going to take everybody. Mm -hmm. It's going to take governments, it's going to take customers, it's going to take society, it's going to take companies like Shell. Um, it's, going to, it's going to need to be a collaboration uh, of many um, and not of one. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe one, one last one, Gretchen. Uh, I, in terms of your workforce development, I, you know, I, I, I have the sense that um, there's a lot of young people these days who are maybe are not super excited about coming to work for an oil company. What, what's your sense of, you know, how do you retain talent or, or bring talent into, into, you know, getting people excited to work for a company like Shell? So we're, at Shell, we're solving some of the world's biggest problems, some of the world's biggest challenges, that's what we're working on. So I don't know how many engineers are in this room. I'm an engineer, a mechanical engineer. Um, and I was super excited to join Amoco 34 years ago when I started, because they were building really big, complex things. Well, we're still building really big, complex things, um, whether that's uh, plants that capture carbon and put it underground, um, or big solar farms, or frankly, oil and gas uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, which this country still needs today and, and will need tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a lot of cool stuff going on uh, at companies like Shell, and the world needs energy. Uh, and so if you're interested in, um, in the world, in geopolitics, um, in complex problems, this is a place for you. Yeah, great. Okay, well, Gretchen, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it, and uh, yeah, thank you so much. Thanks, okay, Tim. Great, yeah. Thanks. Great, okay, thanks. <laughs> 
Please welcome former U.S. Treasury Secretary Larry Summers. Semaphore founding editor-at-large Steve Clemens returns to the stage. waiting all day and for those of you who started at at eight or nine this morning I told you this was going to be uh, the killer interview that I think is is worth everything we've done in either of these places Um, Larry it's great to have you here let's just get to the bottom line Um, and I don't want to frame this in an aggressive way but I want us to sort of think about paradigm if you were running the Federal Reserve you know you and I have been on stage with Paul Volcker before I'm always remember Paul Volcker and the hard uh, tough decisions on inflation that he, he uh, took. If you were running the Fed, where, what would interest rates be? How would you be responding to the recent uptick in inflation? Look, we are not in any kind of mess like we were in the 1970s. All kinds of, I'm going to say some things that aren't precisely what the Fed has said, but let's be clear, it's pretty good to have unemployment well below well below four percent to have the economy be as strong uh, as it is I think the Fed is I would differ from where the Fed has been in two respects one substantively my reading is that given that we've got big budget deficits given how much energy investment there is given how much resilience investment there is, the neutral interest rate is closer to four and a half than to two and a half. And so the idea that monetary policy is quite restrictive is kind of wrong. And so I think it was odd for the Fed to be holding out the prospect that there'd be seven cuts this year. I think it's probably still the case that the market and the Fed are overestimating how much room there is to cut interest rates this year. Should they be That's higher? S- probably not. They probably don't need to be higher now. They should have been raised faster earlier. And if they had been, they wouldn't have had to be uh, as uh, high. I also think the Fed made a substantial mistake in the amount of quantitative easing it engaged in. When everybody in America was switching from a variable rate mortgage to a long rate mortgage Mm. uh, and locking themselves in, the Fed was busy issuing short-term debt in order to reduce its outstanding long-term debt. That that decision will have cost taxpayers hundreds of billions of dollars over time, and there was no necessary reason to do it once the economy had started to stabilize. And I think the Fed needs to relearn what Paul Volcker and Alan Greenspan understood, which was the basic lesson of the Delphi Oracles, which is that if everybody thinks you're omnipotent and omniscient, but you're actually human, don't say too much and keep what you say vague and oracular so you can preserve your credibility don't give a new forecast every week and a dot plot every two months and a blueprint in between because inevitably you're going to turn out to be wrong and that's going to undermine people's confidence in you and when their confidence in you is going to be undermined it's going to undermine their confidence in their own uh, future so i think we have a fed that's been a bit off in its judgments and has been much too overconfident in the way it pronounces on the nuances of the situation at every moment when it can't possibly be right consistently because no one could and they get much less credit when they turn out to be right than they get blamed when they turn out to be wrong. You saw inflation before virtually anyone saw inflation coming. You looked at the American Recovery Act, money ending up people's hand. You began worrying about limited supply and demand, supply chain, and you were quite vocal and people were just saying, 
You know, Larry's lost it. He's gone kind of nuts. Um, you were right amidst that moment, and, and you know, others like you convinced Senator Joe Manchin and others to kind of raise that alarm bell at the time. I'm just interested, one, in that moment of, of whether you know, you've reconciled all those people who, who, who were um, you know, spoofing you, um, but at the same time, now today, where do you, how do you see inflation? You know, I, I don't, some of them still think they, some of them sort of inexplicably to me still think they were right. What? Some of them think they were right still, that I was wrong. Some of them think that uh, I was kind of lucky and that it was other factors that caused my forecast uh, to be right. Some of them have probably adjusted their paradigms. Look, I thought it was a once a career, twice a career kind of thing um, in 2021, where for whatever reason, there was a conventional wisdom and it seemed to me to be a million miles off mm. in terms of the risk that we were gonna blow up inflation. So I said so in very vivid and strong ways. Um, now, I think the consensus is a little optimistic about uh, inflation as I just explained. And I think the Fed is a little bit optimistic about how much it can reduce uh, rates. But whereas we were talking about percentage points then, now we're talking about tenths of a percentage point right. of uh, differences then. So I am a bit more worried given the geopolitics around oil given the way I read the dynamics in the housing market, given the salience of service sector prices, I am a bit more worried than the consensus about uh, inflation. I am quite concerned, alarmed, about if the election goes wrong, from my perspective, a major lurch towards populism in economic policy, which I think could have catastrophic consequences including on inflation, and that worries me. But what would that it's look not like? The, it's not the same degree of difference that I saw in 2021. If Donald Trump were elected and he came in with massive deregulation, wouldn't that be a big boost for the economy? I don't, first of all, I don't think it would just be massive deregulation. I think it would be massive regulation in the form of restrictions on the ability to buy products from abroad. Hmm. which would raise prices and would set off an inflationary spiral. Second of all, I think it would be fair to respect the independence of the central bank and the money-creating process in the traditional way of populists, which would lead to higher inflation expectations, which would prove self-fulfilling. Third, I think it would be the short-run pandering character of normal populism, which tends to lead to larger budget deficits and also reinforces inflation and uh, problems. Look, there's a model for populism. It's the, way Latin, it's the way most countries in Latin America have been run most of the time since the Second uh, World War. And to put it mildly, it hasn't been conspicuously economically successful. Right after the Second World War, people expected that Argentina was going to be one of those really successful natural resource countries like Canada and New Zealand mm. and Australia. And instead, it lost 14 zeros from its currency because of successive hyperinflations and suffered nearly a double-digit number of defaults and became an angry, unsettled uh, society. That is the risk that's at, at stake here. And, you know, it, it's worrying to me, Steve, because I've now been doing this um, as, a, as a kind of involved, uh, invo involved adult through about a dozen presidential mm -hmm. um, elections. And I've always wanted one side to win, but until this time, I've never thought it was a huge deal for the next generation, uh, which side won. 
and I really do think uh, it is. I think Argentina is the right analogy, and with one critical difference, world order never hinged on Argentina, and world order does hinge on the United States of America. Given your political preference here, what is the Biden administration not doing, or not taking advantage of, or not selling well enough to actually do better? I mean, we look at the polls and they're neck and neck. So what's not happening from your both economic and your political experience? Look, I hold myself out as an economist. Mm. Nobody ever voted for me in an election because I never ran for office. And since politicians don't give very good economic advice, I tend to be humble about the quality that an economist's political advice um, will, uh, will have. Right. I think it would be helpful for there to be a clearer sense of concern about the rate at which the country is accumulating uh, debt and the, to recognize that there's a real question, how long can the world's greatest debtor remain uh, the world's greatest power? I think that um, from, my pers from my perspective, um, the Biden administration has not been business friendly enough in its uh, rhetoric and some of its uh, actions. Uh, silly me, I think in a world of global competition and where we're competing with China, I sort of think that our, I, when I first think of our large technology companies I think of national champions mm. assuring American leadership, not rapacious monopolists that need to be cut down to scale so they won't have a chance of competing against China. Mm. And the orientation of the administration's policy is a bit different than uh, the, one that, the one that I would prefer. But look, I think the administration has an enormous amount that it can take satisfaction from and uh, be proud of in terms of the strength uh, that, uh, our, uh, that, our, that our economy uh, has. I think, and I think a lot of the problems are not so much related to things that are being done on an ongoing basis, mm. but I do think that uh, if we had been more restrained at the time of the stimulus, we would not have had so dramatic right. an inflation outcome, and I think yeah. popular attitudes would be different yeah. in that case. Larry, you've been um, saying and writing, you know, the world is on fire out there. We're on the edge of the IMF World Bank, this convening of international uh, talent and, and, and wise folks. You know, we just had Steny Hori on stage with me saying that he thinks the supplemental aid package for Ukraine and Israel and uh, also involves Taiwan, China, um, is, is going to pass on Saturday. But let's say he's wrong. Uh, let's say that doesn't happen. What's at stake in terms of America's message and America's standing in the world? Look, the answer to all these kinds of questions is sort of the same. If you go wander across the traffic, and you don't look both ways before crossing, you probably will get across the street without being run over, but you might well get run over, and it's kind of a stupid cho chance to take because it's just not that hard to do it right and avoid the risk. And you know, maybe if we don't fund Ukraine, it'll all turn out to be okay, and Europe will fund enough, and the Ukrainians will find enough will, and the war will be a little longer, and it'll all be fine. That could well happen. But maybe we'll have sent a signal to the world that you can no longer rely on US strength to resist aggression, and it'll be kind of like the signal that Neville Chamberlain sent in Munich. And it could go either way, and people, 
I try never to do this, but people who want to lend energy to their arguments treat bad outcomes if they don't get their way as a as it's for sure going to be the end of the world. And I don't want to say that because it probably isn't true. But it's sure taking a stupid chance on changing the nature of uh, world, uh, changing the nature of world order. So I think it's essential that we be supporting, um, is, uh, supporting Israel, uh, supporting, supporting Ukraine against uh, Russia. I sure would prefer that Iran be scared of us than that Iran feel like we're a warm, good partner for dialogue. Mm. I want them to be scared of us. I don't know what exactly that means. And I don't think that it should be our purpose to provoke or unsettle China, but I don't think the Chinese should be under any illusions that we will not meet commitments that successive presidents have made in uh, the Pacific. And in any doubt that we're going to establish a world in which uh, countries like ours can over time uh, demonstrate uh, their uh, greatness. I, I think this is a, in a way that hasn't been true through most of my career, it was true through most of my childhood, but not through most of my career, that the United States was really threatened by external yeah. adversaries, but we are threatened by external adversaries right now, and they need to be deterred by uh, strength. Yeah. And I'll, I will tell you that I do, I'm not an expert on it. It's not the numbers I process on a daily basis or even a monthly basis, but it is bizarre to me that budget plans in the United States call for defense spending to fall relative to the price of what the Defense Department buys in light of the rising and growing threats uh, that our country faces. Well, you were, I mean, you and I were talking before about rosy glasses that some wear about climate and not thinking they will necessarily be uh, a major, you know, natural disaster or other kinds. What's going on in your profession that the, there is so much underestimating of the shocks that you think um, we would have to deal with just because of the average of where we're out there and seeing things? Well, look, I, my profession, economist, is not the most popular profession in the world. And God knows we've gotten some things wrong. But lots of times the reason things get wrong is because people don't check with us. Mm -hmm. And nobody, nobody ran anything associated with the stimulus bill through any kind of macroeconomic model. It was all a bunch of political calculation about putting together the coalition and the right. child care credit and this and the that and putting together the coalition. No macroeconomic model at all. So let's not blame that one on, um, on economists. Economists have had a thing to say about climate change. It's been a thing that's mostly been about the need to price carbon. And the non-economists who kind of control things, who should control things, mm -hmm. have mostly rejected uh, that kind of advice. So I don't, I don't think it's right to blame uh, lots of things that people don't like uh, that happen on, um, uh, on economists. I think it's an increasingly complicated uh, world, and that just means there are going to be yeah. more forecasting errors in the future uh, than there were in the past. <clears throat> Two more quick questions. Um, global development, developing nations, um, the lesser, the lowest tier of developing nations 
you see capital outflows in those nations rather than capital inflows. You, the story for development, if you're going to invest in re, uh, resilience, climate, invest in your people and education, you need to have chips to play with. Those chips are chasing returns in other countries and not sticking in. Is that something that worries you? Sure. Look, if we weren't running deficits as large, interest rates would be lower, we'd be a less attractive place to invest, and there'd be more money invested in uh, the developing uh, world. We've had a strategy around the management of debt. The strategy we've had for managing develop co developing country debts is developing countries cut your health budget, developing countries cut your education budget, developing countries cut, your cut down your forests to have exports so you can generate cash and pay debt. Mm. That's been the strategy, and the strategy's been implemented, and that's why there haven't been as many defaults as people expected. But me, I don't think the United States and Europe's strategy for the management of developing country debt being default to your children, default to your future, is a particularly good strategy relative to restructure collaboratively with your creditors, the debts you've taken right. on. But that's where we've moved right. in uh, the last uh, several years. And I think it is appalling that the international financial institutions, like the proud creation, they're celebrating their 80th anniversary of Bretton Woods, the things we put up on the wall as global altruistic institutions. The fact that like on net, the World Bank plus the IMF are taking more money out of the developing world in interest and principle this year than they're putting back in the developing world in interest and uh, principle. I don't think that's the thing we should be feeling very good about. And a ton of what's, and what's constraining them is their shareholders. And guess what? Their shareholders are us. And so I think we can be doing much better in terms of supporting the global financial institution. And if I hear one more person at these meetings give some speech about public sector, private sector collaboration is gonna produce trillions of dollars of green money, while the actual fact of what's actually happening right now is countries with famines are on net paying back debt. I just think we need to see the world uh, as it is and make real choices. Our mutual friend and your former boss, Bob Rubin, wrote a book called The Yellow Pad, and it's a very interesting book. I highly recommend it to people. It's about decision making, you know, in, an, in, a, in a changing uh, set world and whatnot. Um, in it, he's very introspective about some mistakes he made in the past. He said one of them was he didn't take inequality seriously enough. That aggregate growth, growth is what mattered, it would sort itself out. But he now believes in two areas, both climate and inequality. He would, he would take those more seriously. Do you think, we talk a lot about macro issues, but is there a different agenda on the micro front to s address inequality in this country? And do you agree with Bob? I agree with, I agree with Bob spent the first 60% of his career at Goldman Sachs. And I certainly agree with him that Goldman Sachs did not take the issue of inequality seriously enough. Um, I'm not sure I'm prepared to accept that as an indictment of all of the rest of us uh, through uh, oh, He didn't all blame of, you. I through, just wondered if you through, yeah. uh, through all of time. Yeah. Look, uh, should we in a whole variety of ways make the tax system more progressive? Yes. Should we be doing more in a whole variety of ways for poor kids? Yes. What's the 
most important thing we can do over the medium term about uh, inequality? I still believe it's about uh, opportunity and it's about uh, education. And there is too much that goes on in our schools that is just not acceptable. Some of it has to do with lack of resources, but a lot of it has to do with uh, lack of uh, standards. Mm. And so I think that uh, I said this 30 years ago, and I would still say it today, that um, the, in a more elitist age, the Duke of Wellington famously said that the Battle of Waterloo had been won on the playing fields of Eton. And I would say to you that the battle for America's future will be won or lost in America's public schools. And I'm not sure we're winning uh, that battle in terms of strengthening and improving uh, the quality of education despite the efforts of many, many dedicated uh, people. It's just hard to look at the results in terms of uh, what the average fifth grader in America is learning and feel good about the average fifth grader in America's economic prospects. And I think that's absolutely central to the economic future of our country. One last quickie. Um, you're so involved with many Silicon Valley companies and leaders. Lots of discussion on this stage today about AI. Some worried, some deeply, you know, highly enthusiastic. Steve Ratner thinks it's going to be a made the, the driver of major productivity gains. How do you see AI? Most big, most great technologies have less effect in the short run than you think they will, and more effect in the long run than you thought they could. And my guess is it will be that way with respect uh, to AI. It's the end of the day, so I'll conclude with a big picture, 90 second summary of the economic history of mankind. There was zero growth from the beginning of time until a couple thousand BC, zero. Then there was two basis points a year of growth, so 2% in a century for a whole bunch of centuries from maybe 2000 BC till 1500. Then there was another factor of 10 increase from two one hundredths of a percent to two tenths of a percent from about 1500 to sometime in the 1800s. And then there was 2% growth from the 1800s till uh, now. So each era got shorter and in each era the growth rate went up by a substantial factor. And it's at least possible that something like that's gonna happen again because most inventions are a something. Hmm. Artificial intelligence is the first transcendent change in mankind's way of knowing things since the invention of the scientific method. And that is an event of immense uh, significance that creates staggering opportunity if we take proper advantage of it. But as all the various things that followed the Industrial Revolution remind us, it is a challenge to adopt it and it is a challenge to uh, make it uh, work. But I am ultimately an optimist because I am very much aware every day when I read the newspaper, 
I remind myself of this. Events are 75% bad. <laughs> Trends are 75% good. What we read about each day is events, but what does more shaping of our world is trends, and trends that we're all lucky to be Americans, trends around remarkable changes in technology lead me to ultimately be a uh, worried, tense, beleaguered optimist. You heard it here, Thank you ladies very and much. gentlemen, former Secretary of the Treasury Lawrence Summers. Please welcome Joby Aviation President Bonnie Simi and Blaine Newton, COO of Beta. Semaphore Technology Editor Reed Albergati returns to the stage to moderate this conversation. talking about eVTOLs, uh, electric-powered aircraft. Um, I'm a little offended. I flew into Dulles this morning, and you didn't pick me up. Um, soon, fortunately. soon, very, very soon. soon. Very soon. <laughs> um, so um, I'm going to start with you, Bonnie. So you uh, came from JetBlue, um, now at running Joby Aviation. Are there, do you're, so you're, fair, you're, you're ferrying around passengers in these electric yes. aircraft. Mm -hmm. Are there any things that are similar? Like, can you take any lessons from your JetBlue years and, and apply them to this, or is it completely different? Yeah, so, so thank you. Yeah, I do have quite a bit of, of aviation experience, both on the, the operating side. It started actually as a pilot at United, and then uh, a couple of decades at, at JetBlue and operational uh, experience, but also on the technology side. So. Uh, founded JetBlue Technology Ventures. And that's how I actually got interested in this, this space. We had a thesis that electric propulsion would fundamentally change aviation, just like jet propulsion. And so we scanned, it was like eight years ago, and we scanned the globe to find a company that we felt would, would actually take that mission to life. And we found Joby. At the time, it was like 50 people. Already been in, in business for about seven years. Uh, and we invested then in long days, like Toyota, Intel, now, the company's 1,800 people, uh, six countries, four continents sort of leading in the space, and it's really around scaling. So this is where that operational experience comes in as we think about you know, the operating environment, taking this new technology into a very regulated environment. There's not just the operating environment or the environment for the certification, but also for how you actually operate within those regulations. And so we've built a team, and it's really about it's not just me. We have this incredible team, uh, the experience in technology, deep, deep, deep tech mirrored with the aviation and the customer service to bring this, bring this to life. So I think we've got the right team to make it happen. So Blaine, um, Beta, you're doing, you're doing eVTOLs, um, so electric vertical takeoff and landing vehicles, but your philosophy is we're not going to take passengers. We're going to sell these aircraft, and they're going to be used for transporting cargo, sort of like the last mile of cargo, basically. So why is your, why is your approach the right approach? Uh, I don't know that I'll go so far to say it's the right approach. It's a different approach. And, and, uh, we, and we're, we're certifying both electric fixed wing aircraft and electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. You know, we're on a mission to decarbonize aviation. And frankly, we think um, the market exists right now in medical, uh, moving organs around, for example, with our, our first customer, United Therapeutics, and then moving cargo uh, and what you, with UPS and others in what they call kind of a hub bypass model. Uh, and really, that opens up opportunities economically to, in, in rural communities, right? So you can now start to, to connect communities in a different way. Uh, to, for us, a great example of that is we have a, we have a contract, and, and I should also say, we're, we're, we're not taking on being an operator. Um, 
we don't believe that we can be better operators than UPS, which is one of the largest airlines in the world, for example, or Air New Zealand. Uh, and Air New Zealand, we have a really unique relationship with, with those folks. And their initial mission set uh, is flying out of Wellington into rural communities in partnership with the New Zealand post office, delivering mail. And if you think about kind of the origins of aviation, commercial aviation, it was delivering the US post, right? It was delivering the mail. And then that evolved into moving people around. And so just like Air New Zealand is gonna move uh, the mail into rural New Zealand, uh, they'll then start moving people around. And that's, that's opened up, as Bonnie said, by this, this uh, step change function in propulsion. Uh, electric aviation certainly is green, it's sustainable, it's important as a, as a step change to, to decarbonize aviation. But the real benefit is the lower operating cost. You effectively render fuel, uh, the fuel cost uh, irrelevant and you drive down maintenance costs exponentially. So you, you lower the cost that allows you to perf perform missions that were just unattainable before because of, be because of cost. And again, we see our, our, the market entry strategy of cargo, uh, logistics, medical, military, leading then into passenger is a natural progression for at least our airframe. Do you, I mean, there's different ways of decarbonizing, right? You can, there, there are companies doing hydrogen, um, recaptured carbon jet fuel, like, like you know, boom, supersonic. Why batteries? I mean, they're, why lithium ion batteries? Why is that the best um, You know, it, it's interesting. People um, often kind of uh, conflate electric propulsion with the energy storage system. You know, at the end of the day, and, and Joby's doing it as well, building um, electric propulsion systems, right? Motors, inverters, uh, fly-by-wire systems. And, and the real get there is that the best internal, the best turbine engines in the world convert energy from jet fuel to propulsion to thrust at about 30%. The rest is lost to heat. Um, can't speak for what Bonnie and the team are doing, but we're north of 97% efficient. And so you can extract a lot more of that precious energy out of whatever energy source you have. We've elected with uh, lithium ion batteries for now because either there's a lot of data on them, they're relatively available. They're relatively inexpensive, uh, and you can complete viable commercial missions on them today. But as new energy storage systems come online over the next decades of, of this uh, shift in propulsion, then a, a good electric system can take advantage of that. Yeah, I think for us, when we think about it, it allows, first of all, the battery technology is here and now. I think that's super important, that the power to weight ratio is here. So you can take a pilot and four passengers or a pilot and cargo, and you can do an effective mission. So that, it's not in the future. Uh, the second thing is reduced, reduced maintenance, reduced, re uh, increased redundancy. So our aircraft, you know, it's got six propulsion units, but each one of them's got two motors, two inverters backed up by other batteries. And so you not- You can't do that with fuel. And you, you can't just can't, you just can't jet. do that. Yeah, so you just, the efficiency, the, the weight and everything, you can't have that many different, you know, engines, if you will. Think of the maintenance cost of all of those engines. For us, a motor, very few mo moving parts. So it, it's, it's, it's clean, it's safe, and it's sustainable. It's, it's really, it'll bring the, brings the cost down dramatically. I know they're also quieter, and that's mm -hmm. one thing I wonder about when it comes to air taxis. Yeah. The idea is you, you can take these things almost like a taxi, right, and that, that's the dream. Mm -hmm. But are, are, how quiet are they? I mean, like, could, can one of these fly right over my house and I'll be, I'll be cool with it? Absolutely, so that's, you know, when we designed it, right, the very, the very early principles, first was safety, and second was noise, because if we don't have a very, very low noise profile, we're not gonna be able to enter into the cities. So when you think of, compared to a helicopter, that wop, 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 wop noise, or a drone, ee, uh, a Joby aircraft sounds like leaves in the wind. Now, don't, you just, don't just believe us, right? We had, uh, I did a study with NASA, and it, they proved we were 100 times quieter um, than, a, than a helicopter. And, but in the end of the day, really, it's seeing is believing. We, it was just a couple of months ago, we flew the aircraft uh, in, um, in Manhattan. You did as well. Uh, and we were, we were off the, the Manhattan heliport, downtown Manhattan, and, and our, our CEO, Joe Ben, was, was narrating as the aircraft was flying around. And there were, there were some activists there that were you know, wanting to protest new entrants. And then they, they said, hey, hey, can you stop talking? We need to see if we can hear the aircraft. <laughs> And everybody laughed. I mean, it really kind of says, and actually, they, they came to us and they were supporting us now as a replacement for helicopters and the noise profile. So um, 
that's what's going to help us get into communities is it's very, very, very quiet. And I think it's, the same for Yeah, you. It's, it's wild. You know, I, I, the best way I can think about it is, I don't know how many folks in here drive electric vehicles. I drive an yeah. electric truck. It's very similar, right? You, mm -hmm. you can hear a big Ford truck coming at you. You can't hear an electric Ford <laughs> truck coming at you, right? So it's, yeah. but, but we've taken our aircraft on the road in manned flights, you know, 40,000 miles and out from Burlington to Arkansas and down to Florida to do testing with the Air Force. And we stop at all these little communities that we put charging in along the way because we were deploying yeah. charging network as well. And th we invite the communities in. And, uh, you know, the, other than saying, oh, man, when can I use this to get from here to there, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it, it's, man, it's quiet. And it's, it's a real benefit to getting back into these communities that, frankly, I know, I know uh, Bonnie and her team, they want to get into these communities. Our customers want to get into yeah. them. If they can get access to these small regional airports, small uh, publicly used airports uh, with a quiet, cost-effective aircraft, they'd do it tomorrow. You're both, do, speaking of communities, you're both doing stuff in Dubai. Yeah. Is that kind of like the, the test bed? Is that going to be the first place where we kind of see these things part of you know, part of people's daily lives or what, yeah, what's going on there? Yeah, for us, we're, we really look, we're sort of looking at three parallel paths. Um, one is our path here in the U.S. and commercializing here. The next, uh, very similar, the next is with the Department of Defense. And we have some partnerships there and we're, you know, doing some activations there. Again, very similar. And then third is uh, in other parts of the country, Dubai in particular. Uh, for us, we have a definitive agreement there that uh, they're building upon the FAA certification work that we're doing, but in parallel with, so it's not dependent upon it. Um, that'll allow us to get um, early access. The government there is um, very supportive. Uh, and the economy is a good place to do it, but it's all parallel. Could be that we're there first, could be that we're here. It all, it all depends, so three parallel paths for us. Yeah, I mean, I, for us, Dubai is kind of this uh, really good example of where the world is with uh, advanced air mobility, electric aviation. There's almost this insatiable pull from the market to get access to this technology, and, and, and to understand how it integrates with other logistics networks, passenger networks, and so, what, what Dubai has done really, really well in the UAE in general, in, 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 in my mind, is open up lanes to start working these assets. So we have a minimum viable license in partnership with, which is a weird name, but it's effectively a, 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 a regulatory opening that allows us to operate cargo uh, for revenue with UPS later this year. So we'll be flying real missions over the desert with UPS with electric aircraft. And it's, again, it's, it's um, not to create massive scale right away, it's just to understand it and put it to use. And what needs to happen on the ground? How does it fit within existing networks? And we're seeing that all over the world in developing countries where this is a bit of a leapfrog technology in US markets and European markets. It, the, the pull and the demand for this capability is pretty, pretty incredible. Once you see their aircraft flying and our aircraft flying, if it happens to be yeah. uh, their first, it, it gets that flywheel going. The yeah. global yeah. excitement is there, but they really want to see it. Yeah. I want to ask you, Bonnie, just to finish finish off because we're almost out of time. Um, you've been you've you've flown, you've raced airplanes, you've <laughs> you've been doing this for, for for a long time, and now it seems like there's this kind of new era of innovation in in commercial aircraft that we haven't really seen, or civilian aircraft. Just I don't know. Could you tell me like what does the future look like as far as aviation? Like just. Broadly speaking, I mean, is it supersonic? Are we going to be going to space and back? What, what's yeah, going to happen? You know, I think it's just this confluence of so many different technologies coming together uh, that, yeah, for uh, batteries is the first part, right? And so we're very focused on that. There are other technologies that are really, really interesting that are going to do, do further unlocks, whether it's autonomy, uh, hydrogen. These are two areas that I think really people should be looking at um, in uh, coming coming here in the in the next decade or two. Uh, those I think are incredibly promising. It'll be interesting in the supersonic. I don't know. I'm very much onto the green side of things, and so I'm I'm a fan of the electric hydrogen or hydrogen electric, you know, down the road. So this is where I'll be watching for that. Oh, it'll be really interesting to see. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Please welcome Matthew Mejia, CFO and Chief Strategy Officer for Spin Launch. Semaphore Climate and Energy Editor Tim McDonald returns to the stage.
thank you, Matthew, so much for being with us. And I'm, I'm really excited for this conversation because we're, we've been sort of taking mobility through different levels of um, elevation. We talk a lot about cars today, and then we were just kind of talking about airplanes, and then obviously we're, we get to kind of go into space with, <laughs> with what you guys are doing. I mean, what, I think just to give a, a paint a picture quickly, can, can you just kind of tell us a little bit about spin launches? It's a, the technology is super fascinating, but I think it's best to let you kind of describe how, how it works. Absolutely, and, and thank you for having me. Yeah, we can't give planes and cars and trains all the attention. We've got to think about space, think about the future a little bit. Uh, at Spin Launch, our vision is really to disrupt access to space by dramatically lowering the cost. And, and we can only really do that if we do things differently with, with technology. Uh, I'm sure somebody's got a water bottle out there. Uh, if you, thank you very much. Uh, you want to send that water bottle to space right now, it costs you $5,000 at a minimum. And at that price point, we're never going to achieve, we think, the economies of scale in space. Space right now is about $500, $600 billion. A lot of analysts forecast it growing to about $2 trillion. Uh, but we don't think that can happen unless you change how you access space. And, and for us, that's about using new technologies. And so Spin Launch, where we're most famous, is really for our kinetic launcher. This is an electricity-based system that can launch uh, satellites and spacecraft uh, into orbit. And it sounds like science fiction, it sounds kind of crazy, uh, but we've actually launched hundreds of times in our facility in our headquarters in Long Beach, California. Uh, we've launched 10 times in New Mexico at the spaceport there. Uh, that's a facility that's taller than the Statue of Liberty, and it worked 10 times, 10 times out of 10. Uh, I get in trouble with marketing when I argue that we are the most successful launch system on the planet, uh, but it's really because the technology is, is simple and, and it works. And, and in doing that, we think we can start to really disrupt this, this paradigm shift, treating launch more as a cost center than a profit center. Mm. Uh, and that's, that's our focus. Is that, is that sort of what separates, I mean, what, what, what are you guys kind of seeing about the future of, of the space industry that maybe, uh, you know, uh, Bezos or, or Elon are, 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 are missing out on? Because this is quite a different approach. It, you know, it is, and those are, those are great companies and, and real uh, visionaries, and, and we, we appreciate what they've done, and they'll continue to be leaders in the industry. But, but from our perspective, again, we think about the business case for space. Right now, launch is a tiny part of the market. It's maybe five, ten billion dollars out of that 500 billion. The rest is all services from satellites. And so for, for our thinking around future space opportunities, you've got to dramatically bring that cost from $5,000 per kilogram down to 500 one day or, or less. And the reality is some of those rockets that fly today fly at 30% of the capacity. They're flying empty. And so the industry has kind of gone, we think, in the wrong direction. Every other industry on the planet has gotten smaller with our electronics, smaller with our capabilities, more efficient. And the way to do that, we believe, is to remove fossil fuels from launch. Uh, but by doing that, all of a sudden, you get away from something called the rocket equation, which I've been an engineer for a long time, so I'll keep it short. But basically, the bigger your spaceship gets, the more fuel you need in it. Right now, when a Falcon 9 flies, 92% of the weight of that rocket is fuel. So you literally need to bring on board more fuel to carry your fuel. And so we think we've got to eliminate that. And, and by using electricity, we can now focus on the payloads. Well, that means you need to do something very different with those satellites. They can be smaller. They can be more nimble. Our system uh, that we hope to build and start being operating in 2029 can fly 10 times a day. A day. And now, it only launches around 200 kilograms. But in 10 days, we've matched the capacity of something like a Falcon 9. We don't care about the weather. Uh, the, the operation is incredibly simple. We can operate with you know, 10 individuals. You launch a heavy rocket today and you've got thousands of people. And if there's a little bit of weather, a little bit of a problem, the manifest gets punted. So we think this is a, a wildly different approach, but based on, on core technology that works and that we proved in New Mexico. When you're able to bring down the cost um, that much, and it, what, what does that sort of un enable you to do in, in terms of use cases for, for these satellites? I mean, are there was more stuff um, that we, you know, more kind of opportunities to use satellites or different types of tech, you know, things that, that we can do? What's the use? How does that change the use yeah, case? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I've, I've been in the sector for 25 years, and there's some amazing technologies, amazing companies. Uh, but the business case for a lot of these companies is a little bit suspect. Uh, I think right now in space, there's two ways to make money. You serve the government, whether it's NASA or the national security community, uh, and that's an important mission. That's, that's good work and, and done by good companies. Uh, or you're basically broadcasting data. 
through satellites. And that's broadband, that's SATCOM, that's Earth observation. All this other stuff around space mining and space hotels and, you know, as a nerd, as a kid, I love that stuff, but you can't make money doing it. You know, a real t uh, issue of topic that, that we think is important now is space debris. Everybody talks about space debris. And, and it is a problem, although space is quite large and we can go for a long time before it's a problem. But right now, nobody's paying anybody to remove space debris. Mm -hmm. With a system like ours, if we could get a launch that right now would cost you about $5 million if you were flying on a competing system, if you could fly for $250,000 on ours, all of a sudden now, you can make a business case for removing debris. You could launch something up very efficiently because we can go 10 times a day, latch it to an asset that uh, needs to be decommissioned, and pull it back in and burn it up in, in orbit. So. It's, it's things like that that unlock, we think, new ways to do things in space. Um, whether it's infrastructure, whether it's uh, communications, uh, other sensory uh, activities, um, we really have to lower the price point. Otherwise, I think you're still relegated to national security and NASA or effectively data from satellites. Yeah, I was going to ask about the, the space debris. I mean, is that, is that a sort of a risk that, you know, if we make it easier to put more stuff in space, then we just have more of the space debris that we're kind of worried about? Or Well, well right now, virtually everything that goes up has to come down uh, by, by regulatory uh, requirements. Uh, but again, we think by building smaller uh, spacecraft, something that'll work on our system, you're also putting less content in space. Mm. Uh, we think about uh, satellites and spacecraft in the future that are a tenth of the size of what's there today. Uh, it's also true that you know it's a good headline issue. Uh, just recently, something uh, fell from from one of the assets, uh, and that is a danger. But it's incredibly rare. Uh, but again, at, at our price point, we think there's actually a business model for going up and pulling that debris out. Yeah. Just on the, the on the sustainability aspect of this, I mean, we you know I don't I feel like emissions and fossil fuel consumption and these other those kinds of issues are, are not really talked about often in the space conversation but of course there's a huge carbon footprint from launching one of these you know traditional rockets i mean what why is it so important to kind of bring more of this uh, emissions focus or electrification in, into the space uh, conversation uh, totally and and look electrification humanity is marching down that path everywhere every mode of transportation we heard it today and and while space is maybe a little farther off uh, I believe uh, it's going to become increasingly important. You know, I, I live in New York City. My daughter goes to a public school, and she was at Climate Action Day today. She's this progressive, proud little protester, and I think it's great, and I think she's right. I think we can do better with our resources. Uh, but people haven't really thought about it for space. Well, now when we're launching 100 times uh, a year, and with the, you look at some of these business plans, it's thousands of times a year, eventually that fossil fuel consumption does really matter. And so our approach is let's use electricity. A system like ours can use solar, it can use wind, uh, it can use pocket nuclear, it can, it can basically use all these renewable systems that are so important elsewhere. And if, you know, if a state like Texas can get a third of its energy from renewables, I think it's fair to say we can get a third of our launches powered by electricity. Yeah, well, really excited to see how that comes together for you guys. And Matthew, thank you so much for joining us. To talk thank you about so much. Show. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Cheers. Yeah, great. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, appreciate it. Uh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I'm going to just stay up here. Please welcome White House National Climate Advisor Ali Zaidi. Tim McDonald remains on stage. Ali, thank you so much. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, you can just pop into the middle there. Great. Um, Great, Ali, thank you so much. I think that you're kind of perfect person to kind of close this, this session out. Um, you know, the Biden administration obviously has been doing a ton of work on um, mobility and, you know, EVs, kind of decarbonizing transportation. Um, I wanted to just be able to talk through with you sort of, you know, the, what your priorities are, both for mobility and just kind of general climate goals for, for the remaining time in this first term and, and also, you know, uh, later on, if, um, depending on how the election goes. And, but maybe just start with the, the first term. I mean, you, you know, looking, you know, to pass the, the Inflation Reduction Act, I mean, what, what, what is the, in the, the, the rest of this year, what are sort of some of your top priorities to, to get through from the climate and energy perspective? Yeah, look, we're in different places um, in the transformation uh, if you double click on the transportation sector. Um, so depending on which segment of transportation decarb we're talking about, there are different things we've got to tackle. Um, on sustainable aviation, for example, uh, we'll have very imminently the final tax rules around uh, the sustainable aviation fuel tax credit. Um, I think that will uh, unlock um, additional uh, capital formation and hopefully uh, really accelerate the proliferation of both the production of the fuels 
and what we've seen, which is uh, a really aggressive ramp up um, on a voluntary basis uh, within the market for decarbonizing aviation. We've got, I think, a really great opportunity in the movement of freight. Um, when you look at what's happening in the heavy duty vehicle space, um, companies like Navistar are really out there, uh, I think, betting uh, on the possibility of electric. Um, others, uh, uh, partners of ours through the hydrogen hubs, um, really aggressively uh, looking at decarbonization plays, backing out diesel uh, and putting um, electricity generated hydrogen in its place. And then we're teaming up with California uh, to go after uh, electrification of rail, um, which is close to my heart. I grew up uh, outside of Erie, Pennsylvania. They're, they shut down the locomotive plant. They brought it back to make electric locomotives. Um, but I think the place where really the eyes of the world are watching is how we navigate now going through the inflection point on light duty vehicles, mm. uh, on cars and on trucks. Um, this is no longer a future transformation. It's one that's right here. And what we spend our time looking at is not only the sort of where are we day to day on uh, the take up and we're at 4x uh, sales figures relative to where we were, uh, but also what do the fundamentals of the market look like uh, and where are the leading indicators pointing? You look at battery uh, production capability in the U.S. on track to get to about 10 million EVs worth of batteries in 2030. We sell about 15, 16 million vehicles a year. President had set a goal of 50 percent by the end of this decade. We're on track, I think, if you look at the fundamentals, to significantly overachieve that objective. Um, you look, again, at charging. We had set this goal of 500,000 chargers by 2030. Um, we think we're going to achieve that goal not only in 2026, but also at the same time, we're seeing a massive expansion in the production of those chargers here in the United States. I just uh, was with Governor Moore opening up a factory in Maryland. So I think when you look at the, er, the leading indicators, you look at the political economy of the transformation, uh, the UAW and auto workers really starting to be dealt into the upside, um, we feel really confident. So to bottom line, uh, I think for the other parts of trans transportation, uh, in some ways, we're still throwing the past down the field. Mm -hmm. uh, here, uh, I really see us as grinding out the final few yards, uh, end zone in sight, uh, a real um, opportunity to make it through the inflection point and come really, I think, flying out the other side, the U.S. finally in leadership position rather than laggard position, which is kind of where we started out three years ago. Yeah, and I mean, and I was, you know, just going to ask about that. I mean, the sort of catching up and, of course, you know, everyone, we're very focused on um, uh, BYD and you know, sort of Chinese automakers are really aggressive in this space. And you know, when you're thinking about, and you know, I mean, Elon uh, said recently that you know BYD stands to pretty much demolish. That was his terminology. U.S. and European automakers on on EVs unless we get more protectionist measures in place. That's his view. I don't know if you agree with that, or how do you kind of see competition with with China in this space and what the right just kind of approach to take is there? Yeah. I, look, I think there's a three prong approach to this. Um, the first is we need a very aggressive set of measures to level out the playing field uh, when it comes to trade and to climate. Um, you know, uh, within the last month, we've launched this White House uh, Climate and Trade Task Force um, uh, with us, with the National Security Council, others at the helm trying to figure out uh, even in the very construction materials and the embedded carbon, how do we make sure we're accounting for that and leveling the playing field? But, um, you know, I think the uh, Chinese trade practices in this space um, have been uh, on the receiving end of uh, appropriate complaint. Um, they've been uh, a centerpiece in our economic engagement. Uh, Secretary Yellen uh, recently over there talking about uh, these issues. Um, a level playing field is all we're looking for. Uh, if we have that, I think we can be successful. So thing number one is whether it goes to the embodied carbon, whether it goes to 
the component parts, uh, whether it goes to the finished good, um, there needs to be, uh, I think, policy that uh, brings the playing field to level. And that includes, by the way, um, considerations not just around capacity, subsidy, emissions, but also uh, around labor standards. Mm. Um, and, you know, we've seen some real uh, profoundly significant issues in that space. The president was proud to sign uh, the UFLPA, for example, in the solar domain. The second prong of this, though, Sorry, is... And, and by, by leveling the pan playing field, you're talking about, you know, tariffs or, or some kind of pricing mechanism for, to account for those. I things. think there are a, a number of uh, trade tools uh, that are appropriate there. Um, and, you know, tariffs are, I think, one part of a, a, a robust um, trade posture that uh, the U.S. and, frankly, uh, our allies and partners need to be pursuing um, uh, to effectively... Uh, avoid um, uh, a lot of the issues that we've seen, including concentration, which uh, drives a race to the bottom on emissions, concentration, which uh, makes supply chains brittle and vulnerable. Uh, we saw that with chips. So I think we've got we've to mature past that uh, very aggressively. I think the second big piece is we've got to... Um, reinvest in American innovation. I think this, you know, we're going to throw our hands up and resign ourselves uh, to um, being behind the curve on the uh, proliferation of the next generation technologies. That's one, that's a great risk. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you get all of the OEMs on the stage uh, and you ask them where they think battery technology is going to be in this decade. Um, and we're talking about uh, folks who think we're going to be solid state, other things, um, uh, really evolving out of um, some of the supply chain uh, constraints that we've had. Cobalt, I think, will be a, sort of a vision of the past. Um, and really getting to uh, new densities, new durabilities. We've got to be aggressively pioneering that, and we've got to be aggressively scaling that here in the United States. And then the third piece, and I think this is, this is where I really get frustrated by some of the policy discourse in Washington, to maintain aggressive innovation and to drive the U.S. to the front of the global competition, we need a strong and sustained deployment trajectory in the United States. If you look around the world um, at how this technology is played out uh, in different jurisdictions, the countries that had both a strong deployment policy linked to a strong manufacturing set of incentives, those were the countries that were successful. And so we've got to do that. And look, the proof is in the pudding. Uh, when we walked into office, the United States was a laggard. China was leading the world in private investment into EVs. The United States today is the number one single nation destination for private investment, $210 billion. Uh, 15 gigafactories announced and under construction, factories being re retooled and restarted. That doesn't happen by accident. It happens by a combination of focusing on both deployment and manufacturing. Mm -hmm. That's how you uh, build that sort of virtuous cycle. Um, and we got to keep after both of these things. We can't take our uh, eyes off the prize. Yeah, and, and I guess that's, that's sort of maybe, maybe why... Um, you know, I mean, do, do you ever feel like there's a trade-off between, you know, if, if you were sort of only very narrowly focused on uh, emissions goals or decarbonization, wouldn't, wouldn't it make more sense to just import, you know, all of the super cheap batteries and solar panels from, from China? Or, you know, I mean, why does it make sense to stand up this uh, yeah, new, new industry? Yeah, it's pennywise pound this? foolish. Mm -hmm. It's pennywise pound foolish. And look, we've had natural experiments of that kind of approach in other jurisdictions. The Europeans now in a very different position on vehicles and probably consigned uh, their customers to some limitations of the choices they will have in the future. We were very aggressive, I think, about making sure that in the United States you had the choice to buy from Ford and GM and Stellantis and other companies that have grown up here uh, from brands and product classes that people are accustomed to with the 
payload capability and the performance um, uh, output that people have expected from these brands and these makes, uh, that's about consumer choice. I think that's an essential piece. I think the second thing that's really important is, you know, if we go down this road of, hey, we're going to buy our emissions reductions on the cheap today, well, we've seen that in tech, right? You saw that with semiconductors. Sure, you buy it on the cheap today, you're hosed tomorrow. And so on the climate journey where we are in the decisive decade, where we cannot afford U-turns, we can't afford slowdown, we've got to make progress in this decade and the next one and the next one, and by the way, we can't pull the ladder up from behind us, we've got to bring this transformation within access and reach for the developing world, for the global south, to do that, for America to be that leader, we can't just go to somebody else and say, hey, can you give us some cheap stuff today? We're not going to invest in our industrial capacity. That's the absolute wrong playbook, and that's not the approach Joe Biden's taken. Now, on, on a similar point, I mean, do, do you feel in a, a similar way about um, if we look up, upstream in, in that uh, value chain to, to the kind of critical mineral mining aspect? This is, you know, it's, this is one of those difficult issues where people, even people who I, th I think are very supportive of EVs or the energy transition, you know, once you start to talk about putting a, a giant copper or lithium mine in their backyard, uh, there's a lot of opposition to that. Um, you know, should the U.S. be doing more to promote domestic mining? How, how do you kind of see, you know, building out the, the domestic supply chain for, for we've that got to source domestically and we've got to source with our friends. Uh, we've got to expand um, the supply chain and diversify it. But look, I I do think there's a false choice sometimes presented, which is that uh, we're either going to get this or it's got to be destructive and dirty and a race to the bottom, mm -hmm. right? There's a difference between going to the Salton Sea where we're extracting geothermal energy and harnessing at the same time in that brine lithium that could supply a nation and going to perhaps a pristine national park just hypothetically, and saying we must get the resources from this place. I think we've got to think through that. We've got to be aggressive. We've got to be clear-eyed. We've got to do the math. But I think the math will tell us that if we're investing in a circular economy, you look at the loan programs office, their investment in redwood materials. We got to look at this next generation of pulling materials out uh, like what's happening in the Salton Sea. And we've got to work with our allies and partners. Uh, and we can do that, I think, in a way that is sustained from a political economy perspective, if and only if we care about, I know the market may not anymore, some folks, E, S, and G. That stuff still right. matters, <laughs> whether you put it on your like label or not. Right. The American people, shareholders, and the world to sustain investment in this space, expect high environmental performance. They expect caring about labor and human rights, and they expect good governance. And that is our road ahead if we want to stay on the trajectory to establish the U.S. as yeah. a leader. Yeah. One, one, one last question maybe to close this out, Ali. Could, could you say a bit more about um, plans for a second term? Um, if uh, Biden's reelected and we're sitting here on the stage again a year from now, you know, what, what are the, the big priorities, the things you'd want to accomplish in, in that time? And, and I'm wondering if there's another sort of big legislative swing like the IRA that, that you would like to take uh, again in, in that case. Look, I think on the legislative front, um, you know, Democrats and Republicans right now uh, are flying off to their districts to cut ribbons and turn the dirt at projects that are facilitated by an investment fomented by uh, the big infrastructure law that folks passed and the Inflation Reduction Act. And I think as much as the political part of their brain would love to remain in denial about the massive economic opportunity here, uh, reflexively they probably get uh, that investing in the American people, investing in our workers, investing in our industrial competitiveness is working and it's not just working in economic terms, it actually turns out to be pretty good politics. So I think we're building political economy for that. That's thing number one that I think propels us, hopefully, to keep going back. I think the second is in the process 
of doing something unprecedented, right? Truly unprecedented. Cutting our emissions by 50 to 52% by 2030 is truly unprecedented. Uh, in going through that process, we're learning a lot about bottlenecks and constraints. And on the other side of dealing with those bottlenecks and constraints is a whole pot of cash, money, jobs for your district, and a bunch of political joy. So I do think folks will finally get together and pass uh, efforts to accelerate the build out of transmission. I do think people will get together and fund finally what we've been calling on them to do, which is a massive build out of our industrial capability to produce things like transformers and HVDC here in the United States. So I, I think there is a building and burgeoning case uh, for additional investment that unlocks all of this private capital uh, and, I think, um, uh, upside for the American people. In terms of, you know, uh, what we are pursuing now, what we continue to pursue, look, there's a lot to do to finish the job. Um, and what we're finding everywhere we turn is uh, we are more powerful than we ever anticipated in reigniting economic opportunity and bringing jobs back to the United States. So we've got to keep doing that. We, we did it, I think, uh, very successfully um, in repositioning America on autos, laggard to leader once again. Um, now we, I think, can look at places that feel, felt before very hard to do. Um, the industrial sector, steel, cement, aluminum, there's a market for the next several decades in clean production of construction materials, we can be the pioneers for that here in the United States. And that's good for the steel workers, it's good for the iron workers, it's good for the communities that rely on those factories for tax base, and it's good for the planet. So I think we've gotta keep at that. I think there's a massive additional opportunity in the land sector. Um, you know, the voluntary carbon market uh, is still esoteric for a lot of people. I think it's gonna become more mainstream, mm. and I think it's gonna become more mainstream here and around the world, and the country that's out front on building the tech platforms and building the measurement monitoring verification, uh, that's gonna be the country that leads that transformation. Um, you know, one of the, uh, I, I was uh, talking to a reporter after the Inflation Reduction Act passed, and he asked me this funny question because, you know, the, the infrastructure law had a lot of um, uh, sort of first of a kind stuff. Mm. Advanced reactors, direct air ca capture that sucks the CO2 right out of the sky. The Inflation Reduction Act was really about technologies that exist, um, building our capacity to manufacture them and deploy them in the United States. And so the reporter, I think, appropriately asked, is there a moonshot in this? Mm. Uh, and I said, in a, the least sexy response to that question, I think it's buildings decarbonization. Mm -hmm. That's gonna be a massive job creator, mm -hmm. a massive way for us to improve quality of life in the United States. Uh, and you see that in confluence and in conversation with housing supply, housing affordability, uh, a political moment that's here uh, and ought to be harnessed. Um, look, I think next week's Earth Week, uh, what you'll hear from the President of the United States is conversation um, uh, and conviction uh, around this very clear idea that he had coming in that's proved out in communities all across America. This, this agenda to take on climate change in such a bold way is turning around communities. Uh, we've gone from setback to comeback in so many towns around the country. And it's incumbent on us as not just the next six months, but as a country for years to come to make that more accessible to more Americans. Easier access to the jobs, easier access to the savings, easier access to the quality of life improvements. That's what the American people want. Yeah, great. Well, we'll let that be the last word. So thank, thank you. you so much, Ali. I really appreciate it. Very yeah. grateful. Great. Thank you so much thank for the conversation. Yeah, thank you. Please welcome back to the stage Semaphore co-founder and editor-in-chief Ben Smith.
Now that my mic is on, thank you guys. That was an amazing interview. And thank you all on, online and here for sticking it out. What a great day. And um, hope, hope you'll be back here tomorrow. We're, we, we'll be here. Thanks to Hyundai for uh, supporting this event. And, and uh, hopefully see you tomorrow. <laughs>